Ares, Guardians of Hades Romance Series. Written by Felicity Heaton. Narrated by Kevin Foley. Chapter 7 The other men were gone, leaving Megan alone in the apartment with her protector. She had lost track of time during the meeting, trying to decipher what they had been discussing. It hadn't sounded good. In fact, it had sounded a lot like yesterday's storm really had been the start of Armageddon. She sat on the wine-red couch still, tucked into one corner and hugging her knees. Everything she had learned in the past few hours collided in her head, mashing together into a mess. Was it ever going to sink in? She had thought that once she knew where her powers came from, she would be satisfied. As it turned out, it had only left her with more questions. Megan's gaze tracked her protector around the pale, coffee-colored apartment. The overhead lights cast warmth over his tanned skin as he stalked around the rooms wearing only the white towel. It rode low on his waist, affording her a glorious view of the ridge of muscle that arced over his hips and formed a V that led her gaze to places it shouldn't go. She forced her eyes back up to the hard ropes of his stomach. A sexy thread of dark hair trailed down from the sensual dip of his navel, and it led her back down again to the start of the towel. He paused and glanced her way, and Megan's gaze darted to the oak floorboards. Very lovely. They looked like real wood. He moved on, and her eyes drifted back to him. He turned his back on her and huffed as he grabbed a stack of DVDs off the ebony coffee table and took them over to the Black Entertainment Center. Two squat, deep bookcases stood on either end of the long, low unit, enclosing the large flat-screen television. CDs filled the bookcase on the left side, and perched on top of it was a small hi-fi. He went to the one on the right, nearest the kitchen, and slotted the DVDs back into place on the middle shelf. Her eyes roamed down the strong line of his back to his bottom and the twin dimples above it. Every inch of this man was enticing. His muscles worked with rhythmic beauty, a wave of bunching and relaxing as he moved. He was breathtaking. Powerful, too. He had almost come to blows with his own brother. She knew she should feel there was something wrong with that and should want nothing to do with him because of it. That was what convention demanded. He had shown violent tendencies and one heck of a short temper, even shorter than hers was, and that should have made her want to get away from him. It didn't. If anything, it drew her to him even more, because he was strong, masculine, and powerful, and it spoke to her every feminine instinct. She shrugged the feeling off. She had no need to go along with conventions now that she had found out there were people in the world like her. She didn't need to pretend to be something she wasn't, so she fitted in and didn't rouse suspicion or cause people to look too closely at her. Besides, Diamond had been goading him. She might not have siblings, but she had grown up with people who did, and she knew goading when she saw it. Something had annoyed Diamond, and he had taken it out on her protector, wanting to push him into reacting for some reason. Was it wrong that she had wanted him to hit Diamond? Diamond had tried to boss her around last night, and he had threatened her, and then he had sought to belittle his brother in front of her. If she had felt a little braver, she would have punched him herself. She pushed Diamond out of her thoughts and replaced it with the gorgeous six-six, barely-dressed warrior right in front of her. Was it wrong that she wanted him? She had never believed in love at first sight. Lust at first sight, yes, but love? No. She was definitely suffering lust at first sight for him. Her stomach growled. It wasn't just lust pains that she was feeling. Hunger was rapidly becoming an issue, too. It was dark out, which meant she hadn't eaten in over twenty-four hours. If she went much longer without food, she would get sick. Um, she said, and he stopped on the other side of the coffee table. Do you have anything to eat? He regarded her with a heated gaze, raking it over her, as though he was considering putting her on his menu. 
and she tried to stifle the rush of fire that blazed through her blood. She hoped to God he didn't share his scarred brother's ability to smell arousal. Not likely. His lush baritone quickened the spread of the wildfire in her veins. He waved towards the kitchen area. You're welcome to look. Just don't hold your breath while you're at it. Megan stood and walked over to the kitchen, every inch of her aware of his gaze on her. She burned wherever his eyes lingered and barely resisted her desire to stop and look back at him. She reached the black breakfast bar and stopped when the cleanliness of the kitchen hit her. It was immaculate, from the polished granite counter and oak cupboards to the spotless stainless steel hob and oven. There was no way this man cooked in it. It was far too clean to be a bachelor's kitchen, and the stove honestly looked brand new and untouched. Plus, he had a good collection of pizza cartons stacked on one end of the breakfast bar. They had been scattered around his apartment when she had fallen asleep. She smiled to herself. Had he tidied on seeing her in his apartment? Her stomach rumbled again, and she tried to drag her eyes away from the stack of pizza boxes. She hoped they were all empty. If they weren't, she might be tempted to ask how old the contents were and whether they would kill her if she dared to eat them. She forced herself to turn away from the potential case of food poisoning and faced him where he stood in the middle of the living area, his gaze still locked intently on her. I take it you do eat, judging by the array of cartons you had strewn around the apartment last night? His eyes narrowed on her, and then the boxes, and he didn't seem pleased that she had called him out on his tidying to impress her, but he didn't deny it. He huffed and raked long fingers through his tawny, overlong hair, causing the muscles of his torso to shift deliciously and distract her. If only she could feast on that bounty, she would never go hungry. Of course I eat. She leaned her back against the breakfast bar and shook her dirty thoughts away. If you're going to keep me here, you could at least feed me. No response. She had wanted to test a theory and he had just proven it true. He had no intention of letting her leave. Her calm melted away, anger rising to obliterate it. She had healed him just as Diamond had asked. She had no problem with remaining here out of choice, but she was damned if she was going to stay here against her will. She pushed away from the kitchen, striding a few steps towards him, and he turned away and headed for the bedroom. Avoiding her now? Her patience snapped. She stormed into the open space that ran between the front door and his bedroom, stopping directly in line with him. I'm sure there's a law against holding people captive. Oh, wait, there is. It's called kidnapping. He turned on her again, a quizzical twist to his expression. You're not a captive. Megan perked up. That changed everything. I can leave? He absently waved a hand towards the door behind her, and it opened. Faced with the chance to gain her freedom, she bolted for it, not stopping to marvel at the fact he could open a door with a simple gesture. She just wanted to reach the other side of the door and see for herself that she was able to come and go as she pleased, and then she would decide what to do next. Go home or stay here? She wasn't sure which side her heart would choose. The door slammed before she could reach it. She turned on her heel, anger rising to push the fears she knew she should feel to the back of her mind. Tormenting me now? She glared at him, and his eyebrows rose, confusion crossing his handsome face again. Just where do you get off? He shrugged his broad shoulders, and she resisted her need to look at them. If she did, she would probably just go along with his plan to keep her trapped here, close to him. That was a bad thing. Her heart reasoned that it didn't sound so bad. He had vowed to protect her, and he was gorgeous, and she was attracted to him, and he could definitely answer the questions multiplying in her head. I changed my mind. He scrubbed a hand through his hair again, and she almost fell for the distraction tempted to catch another glimpse of his muscles shifting. Karis is probably right. It's better to drop you off tonight and make sure you get home without a hitch. 
That should have sounded perfectly reasonable to her. He intended to take her home and ensure her safety, a very sweet and gentlemanly thing to do. What she heard was not only Diamond thought he could boss her around, but he did too, and so did another of his brothers. No one in this world was going to dictate what she did or didn't do. She loosed a frustrated growl, turned and pulled on the door handle with all of her strength, rattling and twisting it. The door didn't budge. Let me go! She yanked it up and down, pushed and pulled, ground her teeth and growled again, but it still didn't give. I swear, you let me go right now or I'll... What? Unfazed, challenging. She turned and found him standing opposite her, near the bedroom, his arms folded across his chest. Megan ran straight at him, drew her arm back, and swung a slap at him as hard as she could. He casually leaned back and evaded her strike, and she followed through with the force of it, lost balance, and fell into him, her shoulder barreling into his chest. He must have been off balance from leaning back to avoid her blow, because she took him down with her, landing on top of him. The back of his head smacked off the oak floorboard so violently even she flinched from the sound. His eyes closed, his body lurched against hers, hot and hard, and he grabbed the sides of his head. Dark words rolled off his tongue, sounding like the same language he had spoken last night. The same fierce pain speared her ears, and she covered them, trying to block out the words. A peal of thunder rocked the sky. The apartment lights flicked off and then buzzed back into life. Eyes wide, Megan stared down into his dark ones as they slowly opened. The flecks of gold and red in them glowed like embers wrapped in shadows. She lowered her hands away from her ears and pressed them against his broad, solid chest. That's some curse, she squeaked, not quite brave enough to speak at normal volume. Her hands shook and she told herself that the thunder in time with the black words that had left his mouth had just been a freaky coincidence. Not that she believed in such things, but it was the only explanation she wanted to entertain. She smiled sheepishly. Russian? He fixed her with a dark, vicious glare, grasped her shoulders and pushed them as though intending to remove her, or toss her across the room. She pressed harder against him, not wanting to play ragdoll like the image in her mind. She had no doubt that he could easily clear the length of the apartment with her if he threw her. Here, she whispered, desperate to make amends and soothe the savage edge to his expression. Let me. She pressed her fingers to his temples. They throbbed beneath her touch, and she focused on the back of his skull while lightly running her fingertips in circles over his skin. His eyes remained locked with hers, the hard edge to them softening as she carefully eased his pain. When she felt he was healed, she told herself to release him, but the heat steadily building in his striking eyes had her lingering. She swirled her fingertips around his temples, falling deeper into his eyes, becoming increasingly aware of his body beneath hers. Their hips were together, and her legs had settled on either side of his, her knees against his thighs. His stomach pressed against hers each time he inhaled, all delicious hard muscle that had her thinking ridiculous things, like lowering her mouth and kissing him. Megan drew her hands away. His grip on her shoulders tightened, and he hauled her onto her feet with him. Panic lurched through her. He was going to throw her anyway. She struggled and then stopped when she caught a glimpse of his stomach and beyond. Sweet Lord above, he was nude. The white towel lay on the floor, pooled around his feet. A flashback of him in the shower blazed across her mind. Her whole body flushed this time, heart pumping faster, easing into a thunderous run as she continued to stare down at something she could only call impressive. Heavens! She was the captive of a naked warrior who was built like a god. It took all of her willpower, but she dragged her gaze up to meet his. 
The past few minutes drifted away, inconsequential in this moment. What did you say your name was again? She stared into his eyes, lost and hazy, burning where he touched her. She wanted to hear him say it. She wanted to have it in her head in his bass voice whenever she looked at him. Ares, he husked, luscious and deep. Definitely a god. He could go to war on her defenses any day. She would gladly submit to his conquering. Her mouth turned horribly dry. She swallowed, but it did nothing. Her tongue poked out and swept across her lips to wet them. His gaze dropped to her mouth, and the heat in it increased. Not the wisest move to make when you had a nude male stood only inches from you. He was so close that she could feel his heat, and she ached to have him skin on skin with her, burning her all over. His hand scalded her upper arms where he held her in an unrelenting grip. Ares, she whispered, and the moment his eyes met hers, she forgot everything she had been ready to say. The gold in them glittered, the red burning as bright as fire, and their wide, dark pupils called to her, speaking of his hunger and desire. She had aroused a naked, gorgeous man with nothing more than a lick of her lips. What parallel world had she fallen into? Her whole body trembled with thoughts of what he might do to her with the strong, no doubt skilled hands holding her arms and that sinful mouth, and her panted breaths broke the thick silence. No. With surprise, she realized that it was his heavy breaths that filled the quiet. His chest heaved with them as he drew her closer, easing her up against his hard body. His gaze drifted down to her mouth again, and his pupils narrowed. He wet his lips, and her temperature soared to that of the sun. She tilted her head back, sense battling desire, telling her that she shouldn't be doing this. She barely knew him. Desire won. A phone rang. Ares tensed, going still for long seconds, and then he released her. A chill swept up her arms. She frowned at the cold sensation that burned fiercest where his hands had been. It was as though her body missed them, hungered for his touch as much as her heart and soul. A muscle ticked in his strong jaw. His pupils narrowed hardening his expression, and he held his hand out. Duck, he said, emotionless. Duck? What? Something smacked her hard on the back of her head, and she swore he had done it on purpose to get back at her. She grimaced and rubbed the spot, trying to ease the pain, and glared at the cell phone that had appeared in his hand. He casually brought it to his ear. What? he barked into the receiver. Fantastic telephone manners. Then again, if someone had called her in that heart-stopping moment of sheer anticipation, she would have been annoyed too. Scratch that. She was annoyed. You call me an arrogant bastard again, and we'll fall out, little brother. She didn't doubt that they would, not when his voice dripped venom. Which of his brothers was on the other end of the call? Laughter, loud and clear, rang through the phone. He switched ears, and she caught a glimpse of the picture on the screen. The young blonde one. She should have guessed. He looked like trouble. Get me, Karis, Harry snapped. Was that the leader's name? She was having trouble putting names to faces. She hoped to God Ares only had six brothers, any more, and she would never figure out who was who. He leaned down and swiped the towel off the floor. For a moment, she thought he would cover himself up, but he didn't. He dropped the damp towel over the arm of the red couch and walked naked across the room, as though she wasn't even there. Or he wanted her to stare. She took it as an invite and rubbed the back of her head as her gaze followed him. The point where the phone had hit her still hurt, he seemed so comfortable with his powers, and himself. He stretched, 
sighed on to her, giving her a three-quarters view of statue-worthy perfection. She barely bit back her sigh. He pivoted and stalked towards her, intense dark eyes instantly locking with hers, and her heart jumped for what felt like the millionth time. He licked straight white teeth, making her feel as though he was going to put her on his menu after all and eat her up. She wouldn't resist him if he did, as long as she could get a taste of him, too. He stopped close to her and sniffed, smirked. Megan blushed a thousand shades of red all over at the confirmation that he could smell what he was doing to her. Someone barked down the phone. Aries grimaced and turned to frown at the outside world. She looked there, too, and then crossed the apartment to the bank of windows, needing to distance herself from Ares in case she lost control and jumped on him. There wasn't a cloud in the night sky. The thunder had been because of that curse. Don't give me that. You'd swear, too, if you had 140 pounds of woman tackle you to the ground. Megan frowned down at herself. Was he psychic now? She hoped not, not with the dirty thoughts that spun through her head whenever she looked at him. He had hit damn close to the mark, though. She huffed. At 5'8", she was entitled to be a modest 140. It was a normal weight. She wasn't the sort of girl who would kill herself by starving down to underweight status, just to conform, and she liked her figure. And it was rich coming from a man who was probably twice her weight or more. She ran her hands over her jeans-clad hips. Every hair on her body rose and prickled with awareness as an electric current arced through her. She snuck a glance at the window, pretending to stare out of it at the night. He was watching her, his gaze following her hands. Uh-huh. He took a few slow, silent steps towards her. She swallowed her heart, ran her hands a little further down her thighs and then up over her backside and around to her stomach trailing them under her dark pink camisole. Heat followed them. From her touch? Or his gaze? She felt as though he could set her on fire just by looking. I'll deal with it. He tossed the phone onto the crumpled wine-red covers on the bed. She waited, her hands against her stomach, watching him in the reflection on the window. He stared at her for what felt like an eternity a pensive expression on his handsome, rugged face, and then huffed and stalked around the dark room, pulling drawers out and dressing. Megan gave up the pretense of looking at the city and turned and watched him instead. He slipped into a pair of tight black jeans that hugged his thighs and hips, not hiding anything from her gaze. A black long-sleeved T-shirt came next, stretching over honed muscles like a second skin. He shoved his feet into his boots, and his heavy steps echoed around the silent room as he strode over to his closet on the other side of the bed to her. He slid the door open, and she couldn't see what he was doing. When he turned around, he was wearing long mahogany leather cuffs strapped over the T-shirt, covering him from wrist to elbow. Elaborate gold metalwork decorated the worn leather. He flipped down squares of matching leather and metal over the backs of his hands, and slipped his middle finger into a loop on them. I need to go out. He reached back into the closet, and something rattled, and then there was a sound like a knife being drawn over a stone. Not a knife, she realized as he slid the door closed and advanced on her. A sword. A real goddamned sword. What the heck was he doing with such a weapon? He ran his fingers along the length of the blade, and then sheathed it at his waist. Stay here. That startled her into reacting. No, no way. You said you would take me home. She walked over to him, and he didn't even look at her. He moved past her and slipped a black leather holster containing two guns and two knives over his broad shoulders, definitely ignoring her. She moved into his path, not letting him get away with it. I don't have time to argue. He passed her again. His completed ensemble threw him somewhere between Centurion and Hitman, 
and she felt she should be afraid. She wasn't. She had been more scared of him when he had been naked, and the only weapon had been between his legs. He could thrust that sword into her any day. She was dying to have it impale her. Megan blushed and cursed her thoughts. Perhaps she needed to get a boyfriend, or at least get laid. It had been so long that she couldn't remember the last time she'd had a man between her thighs. Images of Ares there, thrusting deeply into her, holding her close to him as they strained together, seeking mutual pleasure and bliss, had her blush returning. He paused and looked her over, his pupils dilating again and making her feel he probably wouldn't be averse to acting out the fantasies spinning through her mind. Take me home, she said, needing to be in control and to do something to block out the explicit scenes playing out in her head. He placed his hands on her shoulders, lifted her with ease, and set her down on the red couch. She stood immediately. Just because he was bigger than she was, and freakishly strong, it didn't mean that she was going to back down and let him have his way. I said, take me home. She rounded the couch and blocked his path to the door. You got me into this mess, so you have to accept the consequences. He towered over her, dark and menacing, and damned sexy with his glowering warrior look. She almost crumbled. There might be food in the cupboards, or call the porter and he'll get you a pizza on me. There's a nice joint around the block. That was just evil, tempting her to do his bidding by offering her food. He was worse than Diamond. At least Diamond had the guts to threaten her outright, not bribe her. Ares's expression blackened, and his hands settled on her shoulders, fingers curling around to grasp her. Just don't think about leaving here. I will know if you cross the threshold, he said, and her gaze shot to the front door and then back to him. Believe me, you don't want to see me angry. Okay, she had been wrong. He did know how to threaten her outright and had trumped Diamond in the process. The darkness in his eyes backed up his words, and she had seen him fight and seen how quick he was to lose his temper. She definitely didn't want to see him angry. He stepped back from her, and his hands fell from her shoulders. Wait, where are you going? He looked as though he was going to war, to pay the price for that curse. He disappeared, leaving swirling black smoke behind. Megan huffed. Great, now what was she supposed to do? She stared at the apartment door. Chapter 8 Megan took a few steps forwards, inching towards the apartment door. Ares had said that he would know if she crossed the threshold of his apartment. Would he really? Or had that just been a threat to keep her in line? Had he been using his powers to keep the door shut when she had tried to open it? There was only one way of finding out. Heart in mouth, she reached for the door handle and then eased her hand back again. She really didn't want to see him angry, not when he had geared up for some kind of war, packing guns, knives, and a sword. He had promised to take her home. He hadn't even said how long he would be out dealing with whatever business had come up, though. What did he mean by having to pay a price for his cursing? Was someone going to punish him? When his brothers had been around, the proud-looking one she thought might be Karis had mentioned that he had received a scolding because Ares had spoken that strange language in the alley. Had Ares gone to receive a similar scolding? Or worse? She didn't like the thought of someone hurting him just because he had spoken some words. It seemed unfair to her. Megan turned left and padded onto the tiled area of the kitchen between the cupboards on her right and the breakfast bar. She checked the large black refrigerator. There were two bottles of mineral water on one of the shelves, and that was all. Nothing to eat there, and she didn't think water was going to ease her hunger pains. She checked each oak cupboard next, both the ones on the wall and those below the black granite counter. In the final cupboard nearest the corner and the sink, 
she found a box of Pop-Tarts. She checked the box, just the two years past their sell-by date. Evidently, cardboard food wasn't to his taste. She tossed them in the bin. He had a more refined palate that preferred food that arrived hot in cardboard boxes, fresh from a pizzeria. He hadn't even told her how to contact the porter without leaving his apartment. She was going to starve to death. She rubbed her stomach and left the kitchen, trying to find a way to distract herself from the growing pains in her belly. He had left her trapped in his apartment. She would just have to take advantage of that and learn a little more about her protector. Snooping felt wrong, so she called it investigating. She started with the DVDs and discovered the short black bookcase full of them wasn't his whole collection. In the small room where he kept his beautiful motorcycle, there was a bookcase that lined the entire dividing wall. DVDs took up most of it, with a small space reserved for magazines and a few books. He had a seriously extensive movie collection, and she intended to put it to good use. She hit the CDs next and smiled at the sight of so many of her favorite albums and bands. It seemed they shared taste in music, connoisseurs of the rock genre. She found a few albums that she didn't have but wanted and glanced at the hi-fi. If she put them on, she might not hear Ari's return, or he might be angry with her for going through his things. But then she was angry with him, and she was damn well going to put on some tunes, whether he liked it or not, just as soon as her investigation was complete. Her eyes slowly slid from his entertainment center, off to her left, beyond the motorcycle, to his bedroom. It called her, and she obeyed. Clothes filled the long, low, ebony chest of drawers, running along a theme of black and more black. Nothing embarrassing there. It might have been nice to find something to tease him about. Megan frowned as something struck her. There wasn't one family picture in his apartment, or anything of sentimental value. Didn't he like his brothers? She shook that question away. Of course he liked them. He had almost fought Diamond, but even then there had been a glimmer of compassion in his eyes. In the closet she found a frightening yet oddly impressive array of weapons, as well as the clothes that had been strewn across his bedroom floor last night. She smiled to herself. She had wondered where they had gone, and now she knew. There was something typically masculine about what he had done, but reassuring, too. He wanted to look good in front of her. She scanned over the weapons on the walls of the closet and frowned at a round shield mounted at the back. A long chain ran over it with a circular pendant hanging from it. She went to touch the amulet, and her hand moved off to one side as she neared it. She tried again, coming close to touching it, and failing once more as her hand moved of its own accord. It was almost as though her hand and the pendant were opposing forces. She lowered her hand. The ring of silver and the triangular piece of metal that filled one section of it didn't look like anything special. It didn't seem like the sort of thing that would have power. She thought about attempting to touch it again, and then slid the closet door closed and moved on. She headed out of the bedroom and glanced into the bathroom. She would save that for last. There was another door on the other side of it, close to the apartment door. She twisted the handle and opened the oak door and paused. More weapons. How many weapons did one man need? He had his own personal arsenal, big enough to supply a small army. Knives of every shape and size, guns that ranged from pistols to rifles, and throwing weapons covered the walls. Megan ran her fingers over a set of small knives with rings where a hilt should have been. They looked sharp and deadly if the person throwing them had good aim. Something told her that Ares had very good aim. She closed the door and headed for the final room, the bathroom. There was bound to be something revealing in it. People kept all manner of things in their bathrooms. She flicked the light on. 
her gaze went straight to the double-width shower cubicle. Heaven, Ares had looked so good in the shower, wet all over, nude and glistening. She cleared her throat and focused on her mission, investigating. The counter around the sink in the oak vanity had nothing other than toothpaste, a toothbrush, and some towels to offer. Boring. She checked the cupboard of the vanity. Shaver. Clearly, he needed to put it to use more often than once a week. Various bottles of shower gel, shampoo, and even some sunscreen. Not really interesting. She kept rifling until she had covered every inch of the shelves. The only interesting thing she noticed was a startling lack of protection. Either Ares didn't have sex often, or he did it unprotected. Not that she cared. It wasn't as though she was planning to do the horizontal tango with him. Her cheeks scalded when her mind supplied that horizontal probably wasn't in his repertoire. Dangerous men probably had adventurous sex. Bathroom sex. A noise came from the other room. Megan shot to her feet, pulse racing. Ares? She rushed from the scene of her fantasy crime. He stood in the middle of the living room with the dark-haired, broadly built man from earlier. She hadn't caught his name. He hadn't really spoken much other than to tell Ares not to go killing the man who had stolen his power. Do not tell Escher about this. He's been through enough recently because of me. Sometimes I wonder if he's getting worse. Ares placed his hand on the man's shoulder, and the man returned the gesture, squeezing Ares's muscular shoulder. The grim look on the man's face didn't shift, but he nodded. Ares glanced at her, and then more swirling ribbons of black smoke curled around him, writhing upwards from his feet. Wait! Megan lurched forwards, reaching for him, and hit the back of the red couch. He disappeared. Damn it! She turned on the man who had remained. He smiled warmly at her. He had to be at least five years younger than Ares, closer to his early thirties and nearer to her age, and his rich brown eyes sparkled, but with intelligence rather than desire as Ares's did. She continued to stare at him, waiting for him to speak, and his smile slowly faded. He sighed, rubbed his wavy brown hair, and looked around the apartment. It seemed neither of them knew what to say. Megan could change that. You're one of his brothers, right? He nodded. Then go and get him back. That I cannot do. He sat down in the red armchair, his broad shoulders filling the back and crossed his black linen-clad legs. Ares only asked me to come over because he thought you might like company, and it is quiet in Seville tonight. Doesn't he trust me? She glared at him, angered by the thought that Ares had sent one of his brothers to babysit her. Company her butt. He could mask it in a sweet gesture, but she knew exactly what he was up to. He wanted to make sure she didn't leave. The man held his hand out, gesturing towards the couch. She remained standing, refusing to do as he ordered, and then a frown drew her eyebrows together. Something he had said didn't make sense. Wait, Seville, as in Spain? He smiled. You know your geography. How is that possible? You can't honestly tell me you just came all the way from Seville. It definitely wasn't possible. It couldn't be. She looked at the motorcycle and then the balcony. They had teleported her from her neighborhood to here, and during that brotherly meeting, some of them had talked about cities thousands of miles from New York. His smile held. Do you think there is a limit to how far we can step? It is a matter of mere seconds travel from here to Seville. Seconds? She wasn't sure how many thousands of miles it was to Seville, but she couldn't imagine traveling there in only a few seconds. She had traveled a fair distance via teleportation last night, and it had left her reeling. The brothers all seemed to appear and disappear without any sign of dizziness. 
They did it casually, as though it was something perfectly natural to them. They also had a strange vocabulary. Demon, hellspawn, carrier, and now step. You can take me home then. It's not far. She already knew what the answer would be, but she wanted to test his allegiance and maybe learn a little about her protector at the same time. And have Ares mad at me? No, thank you. He smoothed the tails of his dark charcoal linen shirt. Now that she knew where he had come from, his choice of clothing made sense. You'd just be taking me home. She reluctantly sat on the couch, getting the feeling that she was here to stay. You don't know my big brother. He's an avid believer in repaying people in kind. You help him, and he will help you. You fuck with him, and he kills you. He gets mighty tetchy if anyone gets in the way, too. So you see, taking you home is not going to happen. There was a hint of apology in his eyes that she appreciated. It made her feel that he wanted to help her, but his hands were tied, and she knew why. Ares wanted to repay her. If this man took her home, would that count as fucking with Ares? She sighed, brought her feet up onto the seat of the couch, and hugged her knees. Since we're stuck with each other, what's your name? Marek. He smiled, his rough masculine features shifting with it and his deep brown eyes lighting up. So why you? He quirked a dark eyebrow. You said Ares wanted you to look after me. Why you? She ran her gaze over his impressive build. He was big, probably matching Ares in width, but falling short by a few inches in height. Had Ares asked him because he was the one most able to protect her? Did she need protecting? His eyes darkened. She was getting eerily used to how their eyes were their emotional barometer. She had said something wrong. It wasn't going to stop her. He couldn't lay a finger on her because Ares would kick his backside. That alone made her feel invincible. Why not the tall one with the green eyes and girly tattoo? Karis, is it? He was on the phone to him earlier. I'm not good enough? Merrick snapped. Damn. She seemed to know exactly which buttons were their detonators. It was almost fun. I didn't mean it like that. She really hadn't meant to offend him. She had just been trying to confirm that Karis was the one she thought he was. Merrick relaxed again. Karis and Callistas are busy defending their cities against demons. Diamond wants no part of this. Escher cannot know. Ares is right about that. It never goes well when he realizes that Ares is well. And Valen would likely try to seduce you. Which one is that? She ran through them in her mind, trying to guess. The young one with the long blonde hair? Marek shook his head. The one who announced you were lying about that boyfriend of yours. Megan shrank down into her knees, tempted to bury her face and hide. <sighs> Fine. I don't have a boyfriend, okay? He shrugged his shoulders. We all knew anyway. It isn't news. She averted her gaze, fixing it on the black screen of the television as her cheeks heated. So you drew the short straw. Guard Ares' new play toy. The bitterness in her voice surprised her. She hated being thought about as something Ares was liable to screw and discard. That was never going to happen. He might be sexy as sin and she might be attracted to him, but she wasn't made for one-night stands. They only ended up leaving her feeling broken and wretched for months afterwards. Is he keeping me here until I put out? She closed her eyes and ignored the ache behind her sternum. Is that the game he's playing? Or did he invite you over to jump my bones too? A threesome, perhaps? She fixed him with a hard glare, her eyes narrowing into slits and lips compressing into a thin line as rage curled through her pain trailing in its wake. She would never let it happen. She didn't want to be someone's plaything. 
Merrick leaned back, pure shock written in every line of his face. I am not touching you. She huffed. Am I that repulsive? Gods, no. But brothers by blood or not, Ares would butcher me if I laid a finger on you. That confused her even more. It made her feel dangerous things, like when Ares looked at her with desire blazing in his eyes. He really wanted her, and for longer than just a moment. Why? She rested her chin on her knees. It's not like I'm his. It is not my place to say, so let it go. You will have to get him to tell you himself. The hard edge to his expression backed up his words, and she decided to let it go and somehow find the courage to ask Ares about his intentions towards her. She wasn't done with Merrick, though. He seemed talkative, and she wanted to get answers to some of her other questions. Fine. If you won't answer that, then answer this. Where has Ares gone? He looked wary at last, his expression losing some of its warmth and lightness. They called him away. His brothers? Couldn't be. Merrick had said that they were all busy or wanted nothing to do with her, and they had just popped into his apartment the last time they had wanted to talk with Ares. He shifted his gaze to the white ceiling. They. She wasn't in the mood for cryptic answers. Her eyes widened. Aliens? She hoped to God he didn't say yes. Things were crazy enough as it was. He laughed, the sound rich and warm. Gods, no. Then I don't understand. His laughter died abruptly. It is probably best that way. Just... Do not go asking Ares when he gets back. Give him a little time before saying anything. He is always grouchy after paying penitence. Penitence? That was another strange word to use. Like to God? Ares cursed and he must pay for it. Our boy never learned to hold that black tongue of his. Merrick frowned at her when she leaned forward curious now that they were on her heart's current favorite subject, Ares. Maybe I need to hold mine, too. He stood. You're leaving? She didn't want him to go. She had actually been enjoying his company and the prospect of learning more about Ares and his brothers. He shot her a warm smile that reached his eyes. Only for pizza. Pepperoni? The second she nodded, he disappeared. She was getting eerily used to how they popped in and out, too, leaving only swirling ribbons of black smoke in their wake. Before she could draw in a breath, someone else poofed into the room. The white-haired one, Diamond. The man Merrick had said wanted nothing to do with her and had been intent on igniting Ares's fury and instigating a fight. His coat was missing from his usual ensemble of a thick roll-neck jumper, jeans, and those black gloves. Did he live somewhere chilly? His pale blue eyes scanned the apartment and then fell to her. They held her gaze, inquisitive and cold. Ari's not here, he said, a frown pulling at his dark, silvery eyebrows. Megan shook her head. You know where he is? Diamond stepped closer to her, and she didn't like it. It felt as though he wanted to tower over her, as though he felt she was beneath him and should know it. He had insisted on calling her a carrier earlier, rather than her name. Had he done so purely to annoy Ares, or because he felt she was unworthy of him speaking her name? Um, something about penitence? Not to worry. He turned to leave, and she grabbed his wrist. She instantly snatched her hand back, grimacing as it burned as though she had stuck her hand into a freezer full of ice and water. Gods, don't do that! He stepped back, distancing himself and glaring at her. You want burns? Just damn well ask if you want something. How was he so cold? She stared at her throbbing, freezing fingers. She had touched him for barely a second, but they were numb. 
Last night he had frozen the gun. Was his cold something to do with that power? Had he just used it on her? Something told her that he wouldn't do such a thing. Her actions had shocked him, and he had sounded genuinely upset and concerned. What's penitence? He glanced at her hand, a frown narrowing his eyes. A recipe for a foul mood when it comes to Ares. I would keep clear if I were you. The same answer Merrick had given to her. I can pass him a message if you want, she said, hoping to lighten the dark air between them. Nah, apologies work best if you do them in person. If he doesn't tear you apart for speaking, tell him I was here. Diamond turned away from her and paused. He tilted his head a fraction towards her, so his face was almost in profile, but didn't look at her. He won't let you go, you know. There's something about you, and right now he's weak without his power. I would leave if he gives you the chance. Eternity with him, without being able to touch, it would kill you both. The bitterness in his voice stunned her. His eyes paled with anger, his look inhuman, and he clenched his fists, causing the leather gloves to creak. He faced forwards and was gone. Wait! Megan leaped to her feet and turned on the spot, disturbing the black smoke. She shouted at the ceiling, What do you mean? Marek reappeared. The gods won't listen to you. Who are you shouting at? She felt like a fool. Diamond, he, he told me that Ares won't let me go now that his power is gone. Something about eternity not touching him will kill us both. She glared at the ceiling. Get back here! Merrick laughed and set the pizza box down on the ebony coffee table. Diamond will be back in Hong Kong by now. Besides, he won't listen to you anyway. Just ignore him. Her shoulders sagged, her tension draining away. She really wasn't in the mood for cryptic shit. Why is he so cold? She brought her gaze down from the ceiling and settled it on Merrick. Uh, Diamond is always distant. She looked down at her hand. Her fingers still felt numb, but feeling was slowly returning to them. No, I mean, he's cold as ice. You touched him? Merrick's voice rose an octave, and he grabbed her hand, yanking it towards him. What were you thinking? Never touch him! He flipped her hand over, inspecting it so thoroughly that she began to realize that he was honestly concerned about her. He moved her fingers one by one and frowned at them. I'm fine, she said, wanting to alleviate his worry. It didn't hurt, really. He looked from her hand to her face. I have to say that I am surprised. You should have frostbite from touching him. Not even I can withstand it. Megan took her hand from him and held it to her chest. She got the message. She wouldn't touch Diamond again. Why is he so cold? She sat down on the couch and kept holding her hand. Merrick heaved a sigh. It is his power. He controls ice, but it became a part of his body. Now he can't touch anyone except Karis and Ares, and sometimes Escher, without hurting them. And now that Ares' fire is gone, even he might not be able to withstand it. She looked up at the ceiling again, her thoughts thousands of miles away with Diamond. He couldn't touch people without hurting them, maybe even killing them. What terrible, lonely life did he lead? She couldn't imagine not being able to touch someone or be touched. A shiver danced down her spine. An eternity without being able to touch would kill you both. Ares shared this problem before he lost his power, didn't he? Her gaze shot to Merrick and the sorrowful look in his brown eyes confirmed her suspicions. Her blood chilled. Poor Ares. Poor Diamond. Both of them had spent God only knew how long without knowing the touch of another. Not all of us have that problem. The rest of us, our powers didn't manifest like Diamond's and Ares's. Megan wasn't listening. She looked around at the apartment and ran her hand over the material of the couch. She had thought it itchy before, and now she knew why. 
It must have something to do with Ares's fire. Flame retardant material. She closed her eyes and leaned into the back of the couch, fingers running over the scratchy red material, the same itchy material that his bedclothes were made from. Her heart went out to Ares. How did having to endure such discomfort while he slept make him feel? How much did he hurt because he lived life without physical contact, always fearing he would hurt the ones he loved? She wanted to know because she couldn't imagine how much he had suffered. She could only imagine how she would feel if she had been in his position. It would have killed her. But he could touch others now. Was he only touching her because he could? Diamond had told him to get it out of his system and take advantage. Is that what Ares wanted to do with her? Or was it more than that? Was the desire in his eyes because he thought she was beautiful and he was attracted to her? Or was it born of hungers long denied? The thought that he might just want to use her because he could touch her left her feeling worse than when she had thought he might just want to have a fling with her. At least then she had thought he desired her specifically, not just wanted to bed the nearest available woman. Do not do my brother an injustice, Merrick said and she opened her eyes. Ares is not that sort of man. He is a good man, an honorable man. Give him time, and you will see that for yourself. She hoped he was right. The delicious scent of pizza wafted from the box on the table, and her gaze shifted to it. She needed her strength, and a full stomach might improve her temper and give her a better perspective, and it would give her time to continue questioning Merrick. It would certainly go a long way towards brightening her mood. Pizza was her favorite comfort food. She stared longingly at the white box. That hungry? He reached down and flipped the lid open, releasing a stronger wave of pepperoni-scented bliss. I think Ares has plates somewhere. Don't bother. She uncurled from the couch, grabbed a slice of heavily topped thin-crust pizza, folded it in half, and bit into it. A moan escaped her. Merrick smiled and turned on the television. He selected a slice of pizza and ate in silence. For a moment, everything felt normal, and then he spoke. Seriously, though, give Ares a wide berth when he returns. Penitence is a bitch. Her stomach rolled in time with the thunder outside. Chapter 9 the light shining directly down on Ares stole his vision, rendering everything beyond the golden halo surrounding him as darkness. His knees hurt where they pressed into the dirt beneath him, tiny stones penetrating his jeans and leaving painful dents that would no doubt take hours to disappear. That pain was insignificant compared with the raw agony of his back, but it gave him something small to use as his point of focus. He tugged the thick leather straps that restrained his hands in front of him, twisting the worn brown material. The metal ring they were attached to remained still despite the force of his actions. Metal of the gods. Sometimes he despised its strength. A whirr cut the silence. He closed his eyes and gritted his teeth. The whip cracked across his back. The sharp sound echoed into the absorbing darkness. A muttered apology left his dry lips. His 993rd. Seven to go. Ares hated this kind of penitence. The metal whip cracked again, catching him straight down his spine this time. He arched forwards and roared his apology. 994. Six more, and he could return to her. Marek had better be behaving himself. The whip whistled and slashed his back. Fresh blood crawled down his skin. These last five were going to be a bitch. The pain of each strike blinded him, and the sweat on his skin stung the lacerations. He tensed his jaw against the raw agony, bowed his head and clenched the leather binding him, trying with all his might to resist crying out with each strike of the razor's sharp whip. The woman at his back laughed. 999. 
Ares flinched and uttered the apology. One thousand. Nemesis struck him again. Ares ground his teeth, stood on aching, stiff legs, and growled as he pulled his wrists apart. His muscles rippled as fury surged through him, restoring enough of his strength to fulfill his desire to be free. The flimsy leather snapped and fell from his wrists. He pivoted on his heel to face her. The curvy redhead raised her whip and lashed out. He caught the braided metal, softly twisted it around his arm, and yanked it towards him. She stumbled on the uneven ground, her blood-red sandals sending small stones scattering in all directions. Nemesis stared cold and hard into his eyes with vicious red ones that glowed around the edges. She frowned at him and tugged on the whip, but he held firm, straightening to his full height. Her black sheer robes fluttered on a chill breeze, dancing outwards from her waist where elegant gold metalwork covered her garment like a corset and reaching towards him like tendrils of smoke. He never had liked her. She was born of the old gods, and her position had given her a smug sense of superiority. He didn't kneel before her because of who she was or any power she commanded over him. He submitted to punishment because he chose to do so. One thousand has passed. Strike me again, and I will see to it that you are the one on your knees begging me for forgiveness. Her pretty pale face and coy, sweet smile did nothing to hide the ugly monster she truly was inside. He saw through the skin she wore to the darkness beneath, and the twisted desire rising inside her, a hunger to feel him bruising her skin and spilling her blood for a change. Perverse. It was the only word that fitted her. Ares released the whip, took two swift steps away from her and her sick hunger, and swallowed his pain as his anger ebbed and it rushed back in to overwhelm him. Each laceration on his back stung, burning fiercely as though all the fires of the underworld were licking at his skin, and he could barely draw breath. He stepped away from the dark goddess gathered his armor, weapons, and t-shirt, and mustered his strength. The air was cool as he stepped through it, darkness swirling around him, and his strength left him when he landed heavily in his apartment. His knees gave out, and he hit the oak floor, a jolt rocking his tired body. Ares! Her voice was sweet in his ears, exactly what he wanted, needed to hear on his return a soothing balm that eased his pain. He sensed her rise from the couch, but she didn't come to him. Marek had probably warned her away. Ares raised his head. Marek was still there, and it was his rough, tanned hand on her slender arm that was holding her back. In response to the sight of his brother touching her, he did something that shocked him. He growled and bared his teeth and felt the darker side of his blood awaken. Marek instantly released her. I shall take my leave. He turned to Megan. Remember what I said. With that, he disappeared. Ares glared at Megan. What did he tell you? He grasped the arm of the couch with his left hand and the coffee table with his right. It took so much effort that it left him trembling, but he pushed himself onto his feet. She visibly tensed, as though restraining herself, and her round eyes grew wider, her skin paling as she looked him over. What the fuck did he tell you? She flinched away. That you were grouchy after penitence and to give you a wide berth. He laughed, mirthless and cold. Probably right. She swallowed and then moved a step towards him, beautiful concern lighting her brown eyes. He turned away, not wanting her assistance or her pity, not when it would only make him appear weak, and stumbled around the couch and towards his bedroom. The moment his knees hit the edge of the mattress, he flopped onto his front, landing hard and gently rocking up and down until the spring settled. His breath left him in a sigh, and he closed his eyes. Shuffling sounded behind him. The bed depressed next to him. He cracked his eyes open. 
Megan sat on her knees beside him, her dark eyes wide and full of horror as they traversed his back. He should have covered up. What happened to you, Ares? The soft way she spoke his name sent warmth curling through his chest, and the concern in her eyes was genuine. It touched him deeply. She reached towards him and then withdrew her hand. A scowl marred her beautiful face, and he knew her anger wasn't directed at him. It was for the person who had done this to him. Is this penitence? Tonight it is. His throat felt like sandpaper, and swallowing didn't help. Gods, he needed to drink an ocean to quench his thirst. His gaze dropped to Megan's lips. One sip from those, and he would never be thirsty again. She touched his left shoulder, her fingers light and soft as they caressed him, and he marveled at the feel of it, at the fact that she could lay those delicate fingers on him without fear of burning. Diamond came by, she whispered, and his mood faltered. Pain ripped through his back as he moved on the bed, pushing himself up into a sitting position. She drew her right hand back and held it close to her chest. Was she hurt? That thought speared his heart, shattering his fragile hold on his temper. What did he do to you? He roared as he stood, no longer feeling the sting of the cuts as he moved. Her eyes shot wide, and she pulled her hand closer to her. Nothing. Show me, he commanded in a rough snarl, scowling down at her hand. Something had happened to her. He had left her alone, and something had happened. She shrank back. No. Show me. He lunged for her, caught her wrist, and pulled her hand to him. She flinched and gasped when her whole body jerked forwards to follow her arm. He inspected her fingers closely, studying each one for the slightest mark on her pale skin. She was right. Nothing. She was unharmed. You touched him, he said, unsure whether she had now. Megan nodded, and tears filled her eyes. To his horror, he realized that they were because of him. He was holding her too tightly, hurting her, being a royal dick again. He loosened his grip, but didn't let go of her hand. He stroked her fingers to soothe them, and then her slim wrist, still marveling over the fact that he could touch her and that she still allowed him to after the way he had been treating her. You're lucky you still have your hand, he muttered to it. Such a slender, delicate little hand it was, too. She had tried to slug him good and proper with it earlier, though, and he had no doubt she would have left a mark had she connected. The ache in his back returned as his temper dulled again, causing it to spike right back up. He dropped her hand. Get out. Megan didn't move, not even when he jerked his chin towards the living room. I warn you, I need you out of here now. The tethers holding his rage in began to twist and snap. He could feel each one of them as they gave. Every laceration on his back, each one of the thousand, was agony that sent fire to his blood and racked his body and not even her presence could soothe him now that the pain was stealing control over him and his mood. He wasn't sure how much longer he could keep his temper under control, but he certainly wasn't going to let her be anywhere near the blast zone when it erupted. He had been a big enough dick already tonight. Leave! She calmly stepped down from the high mattress and then moved around him as though he hadn't just told her to get out and save herself. She made no sound as she stood behind him. Hot fingers dabbed against his back. He hissed in pain and fought to contain his temper for her sake. He couldn't hurt her. He wouldn't. Do you want me to heal them? She whispered, her breath a soft caress against his bloodied back that tempted him to surrender to her. Her question caught him off guard, and his instinctive answer only brought confusion and he struggled, torn in two by it. What did she expect him to say to that? Yes, please heal them so he would be more indebted to her? That would be a declaration of weakness. This was punishment that he had to endure tonight and carry into battle if that was what the Moirai had in store. 
This suffering was as much a part of his penitence as the lashing had been. He had to bear it until the shallow cuts healed in several hours' time. No. Ares forced the word out and stepped away from her, away from the temptation to change his answer. Megan moved around him and settled her hands on her hips, drawing his gaze to her flimsy dark pink camisole and the way her breasts jutted upwards when she did that. When she huffed, he dragged his eyes back up to meet hers. The determined edge to her expression warned that she wasn't going to accept that answer. It was my fault that someone did this to you. It's because you said that funny Russian line, because I hurt you. Hurt? He laughed. A bang on the head is nothing. I don't hurt so easily. This is pain, and it wasn't Russian that I spoke. He turned with the intention of heading for the safety of the bathroom, but she blocked his path and pressed her palm against his chest. A jolt of white-hot pleasure rippled through him. His gaze met hers again. Please, Ares, let me repay you the only way I can. It was my fault they hurt you. Let me heal you. He stared at her mouth, entranced by the sound of his name on her soft lips, his mind on the more pleasurable ways that she could repay him, ones involving that mouth. He shook his head to clear it. Her eyes held a weight of hurt that hadn't been there a moment ago, and she lowered her head and turned away. He caught her arm, holding it gently, and stared at his hand. She felt so soft and supple, so very tempting. Wait. He drew in a deep breath and expelled it. This was going to be a mistake, but the sight of her eyes filling with pain the thought that she believed he had rejected her offer and it had upset her ripped through his defenses. Fine, but there's something you have to know first. She looked over her shoulder at him, her shoulder-length brown hair masking part of her face, and her expression open and eyes full of warmth again, full of hope and something he pretended didn't exist. Caring. He smiled through the pain stinging his back, gunning for charming, and succeeding, judging by the way her cheeks darkened. I'm ticklish. A smile broke out on her lips, lighting her whole face and brightening her eyes. God, he wanted to say more things that made her smile like that, that filled her with light and made her glow with happiness. She took his hand, sending another hot shiver up his arm, and looked up into his eyes. I'll be gentle. He raised an eyebrow and followed her lead as she turned with him towards the bed, a slave to his hunger and desire, lost in the thoughts racing through his mind. She could be gentle with him all she liked. He would be a kitten for her in return. He could do that for Megan, and the fact that he could touch her wasn't the only reason he would refine his rough edges and do whatever it took to keep her close to him. He hated to admit it, but he couldn't deny it as she led him to the bed, her hand soft and warm in his. He was falling for her. Fast. He had been around for centuries, had been with women in that time, but not one of them had the fire, the determination, the warmth and tenderness that Megan had. Not one of them could compare with her beauty, not just her physical appearance, but her heart and soul, too. She had made him go from desiring her in the alley to wanting her on waking to find her in his apartment, to needing her only a few short hours later. This was dangerous. He knew it. Duty and desire waged war inside him, pulling him in two directions at once. He wasn't sure which would be the victor. Lie on your front. She released his hand and motioned for him to obey. His eyebrow rose higher and he followed her command, stretching out on his front on the dark red sheets. The bed depressed beside him, and the next thing he knew, she was straddling his hips and sitting on his backside. What are you... He twisted to see her and pain ripped across his back. He gritted his teeth, grinding them hard, and closed his eyes as he fought the overwhelming fire that licked across his skin. Her hand gently came to rest on his shoulder soothing him, and the pain eased 
chased away by her tender touch. Lie down, she whispered. Gods, she would be the death of him like this. The weight of her on him already had him stirring, and he could touch her. She was lucky he was on his front, or he would be trying to get inside her. He could imagine what it would feel like to plunge his hard cock into her hot, wet core and hear her scream his name. Ares? It wouldn't sound as tentative and cautious as that. He cracked an eye open and focused on her, and he could feel the nerves flowing through her. He took a deep breath, shortly followed by another, and nodded to let her know that he was ready. Just relax. She smiled and sucked in a breath of her own. I used to be a masseuse. He closed his eyes again. What he wouldn't give to have her as his full-time personal masseuse. Wait, masseuse? She touched other men like this? A sudden urge to hunt them all down and kill them swept through him. He shifted on the bed, restless with the dark hunger for violence, trying to tame it, but losing the battle as he thought about her delicate little hands rubbing across another man's body. Am I hurting you? she said. No. Why would you be? He settled his palms flat in front of him, one hand over the other, rested his chin on them and glared out of the windows at the city swathed in night, his mind on the many ways he would kill the men she had touched. Nothing. Just thought I might be a bit heavy. She muttered something else about pounds. She wasn't at all heavy. Her weight against his backside felt pleasant, driving his hips into the bed in a way that rubbed his now aching erection against the mattress whenever she moved. He was finding it hard to bite back his desire to groan whenever she did that. You don't weigh a thing. He mentally begged her to sit a little harder on him and give him some sort of pleasure to focus on so he could block out the pain and images of her with other men. She was his now. Liar. Something had put a bee in her bonnet. He shrugged it off and closed his eyes. She was definitely his. What was he saying? It was useless, pointless. Even if she did like him, there was no future for them. As soon as he got his powers back, it would be game over. He wasn't the kind of man who could stay like this, no matter how tempting it was, just so he could be with her. He had sworn to do his duty no matter what, and that meant retrieving his power. When he retrieved his power, Megan would realize that he could no longer touch her, and she couldn't touch him without hurting herself. She would leave him. If she found out before he recovered his power, would she ask him to let it go? He couldn't sacrifice it for her. That sacrifice would come at a price. If he failed to regain his power and the gate fell because he wasn't strong enough to protect it, the underworld would merge with this one, and millions would die. Ares cursed the Moiré and gritted his teeth. Over two hundred years alone had been torture, but one he had endured and come to live with. This was worse. Being able to touch Megan, to have such a beautiful woman so close to him, to know that if he pursued her, he might have her, was more painful than the one thousand lashes and all of his previous punishments rolled into one. It tore at his heart. He had wanted this for so long, had ached to have someone in his life that he wouldn't harm by laying a hand on them, but he had never thought it would be temporary when it came. He had waited so patiently, had longed for so many endless nights, and watched so many couples in the streets and even seen his own brothers in relationships. Why were he and Diamond cursed to suffer? Why did it have to be this way? They only wanted what others took for granted. Ares, Megan whispered and leaned forwards, her hands pressed into the mattress on either side of his waist. Are you okay? No, he wasn't okay. How could he be? He wanted her with every drop of blood in his body needed her with all of his heart, yearned to have her in his life, and yet it all seemed so impossible. Whatever pleasure she could bring him, whatever happiness they could find, would be snatched from them the second he regained his power, 
and he would be plunged back into a hell far worse than the two hundred years that had come before it. He swallowed his pain and nodded. Even if it was only temporary, even if she left him when he regained his power, he wasn't strong enough to resist her pull. He could only hold fast until she made a decision. If she came to him, if she made a move, he wouldn't be able to resist her. He would seize whatever small happiness she offered him, even if it was only temporary, even if she broke his heart. I'll try not to hurt you. There was so much more to those words than just their surface meaning. His heart interpreted them differently. He had never realized before tonight what a weak, feeble thing it was in his chest, or how much the past two centuries had hurt him. Before he could say a word, she placed her hands on his lower back. The inferno of her caress started in the arch above his buttocks and worked slowly upwards, a careful exploration that had half of him addled with lust and the other half wondering if she was enjoying touching him. Her pace seemed very deliberate, and he had caught her staring at his body countless times since waking to find her in his apartment. An overwhelmed and heavy sigh broke the silence. Her entire body heaved with it, and he could feel her sorrow as though it was a tangible thing. Was what you said really so bad? Does a little curse need such horrible punishment? Aries stilled beneath her, her soft voice and the gentleness of her touch quietening his lust until he was calm and back in control. Her hands reached his shoulders, fingers dancing over his flesh, and the fire in his blood instantly reignited as they brushed the nape of his neck, sending a shiver through him. If I said what you did, would they punish me too? I mean, for speaking that funny Russian language? It's not Russian. He didn't go any further. He shouldn't have cursed around her, and it wouldn't happen again. And, no, they wouldn't punish you for speaking it. So, why do this to you? Her hands pressed into his shoulders. The masses of cuts covering them stung, but the pain subsided as her touch warmed him and then began to disappear completely as he healed. It amazed him. He had never met anyone who could heal. It's different when I speak it. He left it at that, and she didn't question him as he expected. He craned his neck so he could see her out of the corner of his eye while she worked on his back. Beads of sweat spotted her forehead, concentration written in every beautiful line of her face. Do you always straddle your clients? He needed to break the silence to keep his mind off the sensual feel of her hands against his skin. His body yearned for her touch, ached to be buried deep in hers, so much so that the pain was nothing to him. It had been too long. Megan shook her head, causing the strands of her dark hair to sway. Not quite the conversation he was searching for. Is it like malpractice? I'm not a doctor. Her lips tugged into a strained smile that faded a heartbeat later. Getting there, he just needed to get her to expand. So you could straddle clients. She frowned and worked her hands lower, towards his middle back. Why would I want to do that? His eyebrows rose. You're straddling me. She blushed. He liked that color on her. To keep you still. A pant for air. And because I'm healing you. Easier this way. She swallowed and moved her hands down. Her eyes fixed there, but her pupils dilated and contracted, as if she couldn't focus. Something wrong? He tried to get up, but she pushed him back down. She shook her head and her hands pressed harder against his back. She was supporting her weight on them. She paled and shifted them lower. Her eyes closed. Alarm zinged through his blood. Megan? He pushed himself up onto his elbows. She swayed and then slumped onto the bed beside him. He quickly pulled her to him, cradling her gently in his right arm. Her shallow, intermittent breathing sent a cold, prickly wave crawling over him, and he patted her cheek to rouse her and then stilled with his hand against her. She was freezing. Megan? He shook her and his heart lodged in his throat. 
It didn't come down even when her eyes fluttered open. Are you all right? He searched her eyes, and they focused on him. He tilted her towards the light, studying them. Her pupils contracted and then dilated again when he tipped her back towards the darkness. A normal response. Her skin was warming beneath his hands, too. She inhaled and dazedly looked at his hands where they touched her, and then the bed. Did I finish? Cuts still stung his lower back, but he didn't have the heart to tell her, not when healing him had clearly taken so much out of her, enough that she had looked close to death. He pulled her nearer to him until her breath skated across his bare chest, unable to tamp down the need to feel her in his arms, safe and sound. If he had known that healing him would drain her, he never would have agreed to it. She had risked her life to heal a few stupid cuts that would have closed in a handful of hours. I'm fine now, he whispered, and brushed the damp strands of hair from her forehead. Are you? She gave him the thumbs up. Peachy. She didn't look peachy. He wasn't sure how carriers used their powers or the effects it had on them. Was it always like this for her, or was it because she was trying to heal a god? I'm feeling a little tired. She yawned so wide he could see her lack of tonsils. Can you take me home now? Ares shook his head and told himself that he couldn't because paying penitence had taken most of his strength and he needed to conserve the rest in case something happened in the last few hours of darkness. It had nothing to do with the fact he didn't want to take her home. Tomorrow? She whispered fading fast in his arms, and gods it felt good to have her pressed against him, falling asleep in his embrace. Too good. He wanted to stay right where he was and hold her while she slept, watching over her, but she would get cold even with his body pressed against hers. He slid his other arm under her knees, shut out the pain in his back, and lifted her. He carried her up the length of the double bed and settled her with her head on the pillows. Wait. Her hand skimmed over his chest, kittenish in strength, and fell back to her stomach. I'm not sleeping with you. He smiled. It's my bed. He waited for her to mention sleeping on the couch. She didn't. She huffed, and he watched, bemused as she moved all the pillows and stacked them down the middle of the bed, creating a wall between the two halves. It was going to take a lot more than pillows to stop him if he got another urge to hold her. There was a smile on her face when she settled down again, pulling the wine covers up and tucking them under her arms. Within seconds, she was breathing light and even, fast asleep. Ares stripped off his jeans and headed towards the bathroom. The smell of pizza made him detour to the coffee table. He crammed one slice into his mouth, gathered his T-shirt, weapons, and van braces, and chewed as he took them and placed them back into the cupboard in his bedroom. He grabbed another slice on his way through the living room, eating it as he walked to the bathroom. Penitence always made him hungry. He paused just short of the door and looked back at Megan where she lay in his bed and grimaced. Her hands were dirty. He should have cleaned up before letting her heal him. She shouldn't have had to touch him when he was a mess. He finished the pizza slice, wet a cloth in the bathroom sink, and went back to her. He crouched beside her and carefully cleaned the blood off her hands, making sure to remove every speck. She didn't stir once. When he was done, he stared at her, tempted to stroke her pale cheek and savor how good she felt beneath his fingers. Instead, he tore himself away, stalked into the bathroom, and tossed the bloodied hand towel into the white sink. He switched the shower on, stripped out of his underwear, and stepped into the cubicle. It was hard to resist touching himself when Megan had fired him up, so he made it a quick shower, just long enough to get the blood off his skin, and then toweled off and put his black trunks back on. His feet felt heavy as he exited the bathroom and approached his bedroom. Sleeping on the couch would be the honorable thing to do. He pulled in a deep breath and flexed his fingers. God, he hadn't felt this nervous in a long time. His palms sweated and fingers trembled. 
All he was going to do was sleep near her. It was no different to sleeping on the couch. He would stay on his side of the barricade, and she would remain on hers, and they would both get some rest. If the gate called him, he would feel it and awaken. He shook his hands in an attempt to get rid of his nerves and rounded the double bed to the side nearest the windows. He sat on the bed, pulled the wine covers up to his waist, and rolled straight onto his side to face her as he lay down, so his back didn't touch the bed. Her soft breathing filled the silence. He had been a fool to think he could resist her. He swallowed again to ease his dry throat, reached over the barrier, and stroked her cheek with his fingertips. They shook harder, and he smiled at how stupid he was, being overwhelmed by something so simple. She would laugh at him if she knew just how deeply she affected him. He traced the curve of her jaw and hesitated with his thumb close to her mouth. His trembling increased as he stared at her lips, battling his fierce need to know how they felt. He drew in another stuttering breath and swept the pad of his thumb over her lower lip. His breathing hitched, loud in the quiet room, and he shook right down to his heart. She was soft and warm, and everything incredible beneath his caress. No woman in his past came close to her. She towered above them all, perfection incarnate, a goddess. His cock ached and throbbed, rock hard in his trunks. He had never felt anything as glorious and tempting as Megan. He reluctantly drew his hand away so she could sleep undisturbed, but kept his eyes locked on her. She was beautiful. Ares settled down on his side of the bed, tucking his arm under his head. He smiled at that. It was a strange feeling. He had never had a designated side of a bed before. It felt good, dangerously good. Chapter 10 Megan woke slowly. Every inch of her warmed to just the right temperature the one that always made her want to stay in bed all day. She snuggled into the covers and froze when her pillow moved. She carefully cracked one eye open and then the other. A broad swath of bronzed skin stretched taut over defined muscles, evening sunlight playing across it. Oh, he hadn't. She eased herself up and realized with horror that he really hadn't invaded her side of the bed. She had invaded his. Unwilling to be caught and have him tease her about the fact that she had been the one to break the rules she had set down, she slowly inched away from him. He foiled her escape by rolling onto his side, tossing his arm around her waist and pulling her towards him until her back was flush against his chest. Her body got the wrong idea as he curled up behind her, holding her close to him so the entire length of his hard body pressed against hers. His hand settled against her stomach, and he tried to pull her closer, his breath warm as he murmured into her ear, You're more than welcome to share my heat. I'm sorry. She couldn't manage to get her voice above a breathless whisper. She placed her hand over his, curled her fingers around, and tried to pull it away from her bare stomach. When the heck had he burrowed it under her camisole? He resisted her, his arm tightening and fingers digging in. She cursed his strength and gave up. He made a low, contented noise in his throat. Stay a while, he mumbled sleepily into her ear. I just need to feel this a while. What Diamond and Merrick had told her came back to her, instantly clearing the haze of sleep from her mind. Ares wasn't going to let her go. She could see that now. The question was, did she want him to? She shoved that question away, unwilling to consider the answer to it right now. She didn't know anything about him other than he kept protecting her and the small tidbits of information Marek had given her. Just because being around him felt incredibly good, it didn't mean that it was right or that things weren't going to turn out just as she feared they would, with him wanting her purely because she was a female within reach. She tried to prize his hand off her stomach again unable to think clearly while he was touching her, but he tightened his hold and she didn't have the energy to fight him. It quickly dissipated, 
leaving her feeling weak and in need of another day of sleep. She felt better than she had on waking yesterday, but things had taken a frightening turn when healing the wounds he'd had from paying penitence. She had never experienced such a drain before. It had felt as though she had put her own life in danger by healing his body. She had healed some major injuries before, far worse than what had littered his back, and it hadn't drained her so badly. Was it because he was like her? It felt as though it was more than that. He was more than that. He wasn't just gifted like she was. He was something else. What, she didn't know. And she couldn't deny that it felt good, ridiculously good, to be held in his strong arms, and that she had felt a little pleased by his refusal to release her. What was she getting herself into? Neon signs flashed warnings of heartbreak ahead, but she failed to heed them. Whenever she convinced herself to keep her distance and save herself, to end everything before it had a chance to begin, he would do something that would tear her defenses back down again and leave her aching to be close to him. She closed her eyes and swore she would just steal this moment. She needed something to keep her going through the next few years alone. It felt so good to be held again, to be with someone who made her feel normal who made her feel that she could be herself without having to be careful or fear they would think she was a freak. It was such a relief. Was the desire she felt for Ares, her need to remain around him, in part a response to that? Or was she truly attracted to him, not just attracted to the thought that she could be herself without fear? Was she using him? That would take the cake. She had worried for hours that he was out to use her and she might be doing the same to him. She groaned. You feeling okay? He said, his voice still gravelly with sleep. No, she wasn't. Peachy. He huffed against the back of her head. You said that last night and you looked close to passing out at the time. You don't have to lie to me. She knew that. She wriggled closer to him, and her eyes shot wide. That was definitely a hard-on he had just pressed against her bottom. Sure, she had been alone a long time, and she was wearing jeans, but the feel of it was unmistakable and arousing. She shimmied forwards and turned on him with a frown. He lifted his shoulders, the motion nonchalant. What? Even gods get morning wood sometimes and waking up next to a beautiful woman makes it a dead cert. Her eyes widened further. She spluttered, You're, you're a god? And it's evening. He smiled, his dark eyes lighting up with amusement, rolled onto his back, and stretched, the action pulling the sheet down to give her a glorious view of his torso and the tempting ridge of muscle that hugged his hip. I've been nocturnal for a very long time. His smile widened into a grin. The sheet fell lower, revealing his black underwear. She shot up and stared towards the kitchen, her cheeks scalding hot. I need some water. It sounded like a reasonable excuse to leap from the bed and his arms, and she was parched. He yawned, rolled out of bed, and patted around the foot of it. She tried not to stare as he scooped his jeans up off the floor and pulled them on tugging them over his firm backside and buttoning them. I'll head out and pick us up some breakfast if you tell me what you like, he said, and she couldn't stop herself from smiling. It was nice of him to care. He caught it and shrugged. I was just guessing that leftover pizza wasn't your style. Megan pushed the covers aside and stood. You'd be surprised then. I would happily eat day-old pizza for breakfast. But a pastry and some coffee would be nice, thank you. His cheeks darkened, and she marveled at the reaction. Yesterday she had aroused him with just a sweep of her tongue over her lips, and now he was blushing because she had thanked him. If Merrick hadn't told her that Ares had been alone for a long time, unable to touch anyone without hurting them, she might not have understood why he had such intense reactions. She understood completely, though. He had been starved of physical contact, 
trapped within his own body. She stared into his dark eyes, trying to figure out how it had made him feel, wanting to know. The shine left them and they narrowed as he turned away, grabbed a t-shirt, and pulled it on. He disappeared. She sighed and straightened the covers out on the bed. Where had he gone? To get her breakfast? Had he seen in her eye the questions she wanted to ask him? She hoped he would come back soon. If he did, she would hold her tongue and wouldn't probe into the pain he held in his heart. Or at least she would try to hold it. She wandered through his apartment, snagging her black jumper on the way past the couch and pulling it on over her head. She eyed the pizza on the table as she smoothed her jumper down over her jeans and then kept going, rounding the armchair and heading towards his motorcycle. It was beautiful, a classic. She had seen one like it before, and Ares had kept his in perfect condition. She traced her fingers over the flames on the black fuel tank of the Harley Wide Glide, the sight of it transporting her back to her childhood and better times. There were faint scorch marks in places on the tank and the black leather seat. She smiled at them. Clearly, his bike wasn't flame retardant. She ran her hands up, settled them around the grips, and bit her lip. It was beyond tempting. She glanced around her to make sure he hadn't silently appeared in the apartment and then back at the bike. If she sat on it and he caught her, would he be mad? It wasn't as though she was going to start it up or even move it. She just wanted to sit on it. He reappeared with a brown bag. She gasped and jerked away from his motorcycle. His right eyebrow rose and he offered the paper bag to her, nodding towards his ride at the same time. You like it? She took the bag from him and removed the cup of coffee. There were a lot of pastries. She looked at him. I really hope you don't think I eat this much. He smiled, shook his head, and swiped the bag from her hand. He dug into it, pulled out a croissant, and crammed it into his mouth. He seemed in a much better mood now than when he had left, and she liked it and the way he had been looking at her today. She didn't want to ruin it. Your ride is beautiful, she said, and sipped her coffee, a sudden thought hitting her. Had he called her beautiful earlier? She stifled the blush that wanted to rise onto her cheeks and focused on the bike. My father had one just like it. I'm sorry. His gruff tone made her look over her shoulder at him. Why? She took another sip. They died a long time ago, and I was very young. My grandparents took me in and raised me. He offered her a croissant, and she took it. No brothers and sisters? She shook her head. I sort of envy you for that. I always wanted a brother. They're not that fantastic. He smiled again and waved half a pastry around. You can have them if you want. She smiled. No, thank you. Keep them. They seem like a handful. He shrugged and walked around her, leaned his bottom against the seat of his motorcycle and stroked the fuel tank, a softness to his dark eyes that told her how much it meant to him. I always wanted a motorcycle. I wanted to be like my dad. She set her coffee down on the bookcase behind her and walked her fingers over the bike's handlebars. My grandma didn't like the idea. She always said I was a wild spirit anyway, like my father, and that she didn't want me getting into trouble. It didn't stop me from getting into scrapes. I used to hike in the mountains on weekends and get lost. My grandpa had to come searching for me so many times, he lost count. One time a bear came at me and I had to shoot him with my rifle. You handled my gun pretty well. He ate the rest of his pastry and dusted the crumbs off his hands. Megan shrugged and fixed her gaze on his right hand where it rested on the fuel tank. Strong, large, beautiful. Hands made for holding, possessively, protectively. She heeded at just the memory of being in his arms, of feeling those powerful hands on her shoulders, against her back, holding her tucked close to him as he protected her from his brothers. His enemy, the world. I've never shot a handgun before, she murmured, lost in her memories, in the delicious replay of just how good his hands had felt on her. 
I used to go shooting all the time with my grandpa, though, back when I was in Canada. Thoughts about everything she had left behind all those years ago overshadowed her more recent memories, and her chest ached in response. She patted the fuel tank and met his gaze, and she didn't like the look in his eyes. If she didn't say something to distract him, he was going to keep pressing about her life, and she couldn't bear thinking about it right now. How long have you had it? She stroked the tank, and her fingers brushed his. A bolt of electricity raced up her arm, and she tensed. His fingers flexed against the fuel tank. Had he felt that? I've had it since the first model rolled off the line. He drummed his fingers on the tank as casual as anything, but his eyes betrayed him, revealing that brief touch had affected him, too. She's a beauty. It was love at first sight, and I knew I had to have her. My brothers called me crazy, meddling with mortal vehicles. He laughed, and the warmth of it sent another pleasant shiver through her. It's a 1980 model, isn't it? she said, and he nodded. I didn't think you would have been more than a few years old back then. It wasn't your father's? He chuckled again. No, father doesn't approve of them, but I am flattered that you think I'm a kid. A kid? How old was he? You ever ride it? She stared at him while he ran a loving gaze over his Harley. He couldn't be a day over thirty-eight, could he? Sometimes. I haven't taken her out in a long time. My power has been slowly taking more control. I guess that isn't a problem now. He smiled at her, but she saw straight through it to the conflict it masked. He had said he wanted his power back. Didn't he want it back any more? If he got it back, he would lose his ability to touch again and would go back to living life afraid of hurting others. If she had been starved of physical contact, forced to keep away from others for fear of burning them because of her power, and she had lost it, she probably would have been torn too, tempted to let it go in exchange for being able to touch others. Would you let me ride it? He stared at her, and she had the feeling he was trying to imagine her on his bike. She could handle it. He kept staring, and her hope slowly deflated. He was going to say no. He nodded. Eat your breakfast. He pushed away from the motorcycle and kicked his boots off, leaving them in the middle of the room. It's getting dark out. It's more like dinner. Her gaze followed him, and he grabbed the back of his T-shirt and pulled it off. He let it fall over the back of the armchair, slumped into it, and kicked his feet up onto the coffee table. She grabbed her drink and turned to take the long route to the couch, but her gaze caught on his left arm and the tattoo that curved over his deltoid and part of his biceps. She set her drink and the bag down on the coffee table, but didn't take her eyes away from the elaborate array of swirls and spikes a shade or two darker than his skin. She reached out without thinking and ran her fingertips over it, tracing the almost shield-like design. Ari shivered beneath her touch, and she smiled inside, loving how fiercely he reacted whenever she made contact with him. The ink was raised, pronounced on his skin. Incredible. He looked down at it and her hand. It's where Ares touched me when I was a baby. You're not the real god of war, then? She waited for him to laugh and say the god thing had just been a joke, and he wasn't serious this time, either but he just shook his head. She swallowed. Is he your father? The building shook, and she gasped. Earthquake! She grabbed the back of the armchair with her right hand and his shoulder with her left. He shook his head again. My father hates it when someone asks me that. Ares likes my mother. His father had done that? What sort of man had the power to shake the world with his anger? It had been incredible enough when she had thought Ares was like her, just a man with gifts, but now she was beginning to believe that he wasn't lying. He was a god. Your mother? And who the heck was she? Things were taking a severe turn towards the weird since she had woken up in the arms of a god this evening, 
and all she could do was let it sweep her along until she reached the end of the rapids and calm water again. Or a waterfall. Persephone. Father would kill Ares for stepping within five hundred meters of her. She blinked. My knowledge of Greek gods is a little rusty. I need to get something straight. You're saying your father is Hades, as in the god of hell? The one who forced Persephone? Mother loves my father. His expression blackened, and he shirked her touch, fixing her with a dark glare. Another raw nerve. Megan decided to leave that one alone in case he ended up feeling a desire to hurl her across the room again. My mistake. You're not the real Ares, because that would be ridiculous. You're the son of Hades and Persephone. His smile returned. I can see why it might be hard for you to believe this. It's true. I'm named for him, though he saw me only once to bestow his favor upon me. Father forbids him to enter the underworld. She could understand why. It wouldn't do to have someone as strong as the real Ares, god of war, hitting on your wife, even if you were Hades. This was a lot to take in. I really thought you were Hellspawn. Although she still wasn't sure what the heck they were either. He laughed. No, just a regular god. She rounded the coffee table and flopped down on the end of the couch nearest to him before her legs gave out and stared at her paper cup on the ebony surface near his feet. The thought that he was a god swirled around her mind but wouldn't sink in. She blinked and shifted her gaze to him, stared at him to convince herself that this was real. He was a god, a real-life god, a son of Hades the ruler of the underworld. It still refused to sink in. If he was a god, surely she would have read about him. Someone would have documented that there were two gods named Ares. They definitely would have documented that Hades and Persephone had managed to make seven strapping boys. How come you and your brothers aren't in the history books? He tunneled his fingers through his overlong, tawny hair preening it back out of his face. They stopped writing them. Simple as that. She raked her gaze over him, lingering longest on his face. He still didn't look a day over thirty-eight. You and your brothers all look different ages. The one with the long blonde hair is much younger. Callistos, is it? And the one with the black hair, Charis? He looks like he's maybe a couple of years older or the same age as you. Charis? The same age as me? Both of his eyebrows shot up and his dark eyes sparkled with amusement. It might look like that to mortal eyes, but it certainly isn't the case. She had feared as much. People painted pictures of the gods all the time, and they didn't look centuries old. She peered closer. How old are you? A smile tugged at one corner of his sensual mouth. Younger than the history books. That wasn't very giving. The edge of discomfort in his eyes made her feel that he didn't want to tell her. Or was it the fact that they had missed the history books? She eyed him, trying to think of him as the son of a god rather than a man. He was strong. Did strength come with age? Two hundred. It sounded like a reasonable age for him. He snorted contemptuously. <laughs> insulting me now? I've been stuck in the mortal world for longer than that. He had? He had spent over two centuries unable to touch anyone? It was a miracle the man was sane. The thought of going without touching someone for a few decades had left her feeling cold inside, but living like that for centuries? She wanted to get up, sit on his lap, wrap her arms around him and hold him. He wouldn't like it, though. There was something she had learned about Ares from her time with him. He hated anything that made him feel weak, and her pitying him would do just that. Every muscle in his body rippled as he stood and straightened to his full height, and she focused on their conversation again. Okay, so he was older than two hundred. She stared up at him calculating and considering. 
He walked between the couch and the coffee table, heading for the kitchen. She frowned. The horrible red lines from last night were gone from his back, but the silvery scars she had seen when she had healed the burns on his back the night they had met were still there. The haphazard array of thin streaks littered his skin, cutting over muscles in unfaltering lines. He strolled into the kitchen, grabbed a glass, and filled it with water. When it came down to it, she couldn't for the life of her figure out how old he was by looking at him. He just looked in his late thirties to her. All she could do was guess and hope she hit near to the mark. Seven hundred. He sighed and raised his left hand above his head as he walked back to her. The muscles of his torso shifted delightfully, distracting her. Nine hundred? Her voice sounded weak, even to her own ears. He smiled. Close enough. Under or over? It seemed insane to be asking such a question. Over. She stared at him, trying to convince herself that he really did look that old. No matter what she did, he still appeared as though he was closing in on forty rather than one thousand. And Karis is older? She hoped it wasn't by much. Just thinking about his brothers and how old they might be had her head aching. Callistus looked as though he was barely pushing thirty. How old was he, really? By around fifty years. Ares eased back down into the armchair and set his glass of water down on the coffee table. Megan supposed that his father was still alive, judging by the earlier earthquake, and that Hades must be thousands of years old. If Hades was real, and Persephone too, then all of those other gods had to be real too. Zeus, Poseidon, Apollo, and a lot of others who she could no longer remember. Ares sipped his water and rifled through the brown paper bag. He plucked a pen of chocolat from the pastries and bit into it. She had absolutely zero reason to believe he was telling her the truth. She had zero reason to believe he was lying, too. He and his brothers had more than one power each, and Ares had incredible strength. He was a warrior to his core just as she had imagined the Greek gods to be when learning about them in her youth. You look as though you're having a hard time with this. He leaned back into the red armchair, his shoulders as wide as the padded back of the seat. It's really quite simple. Gods exist. Think of Hellspawn as distant relatives of the gods, if you need some sort of connection to make it easier for you to believe me. They tend to have a single power, or sometimes no power at all. Because they have blood of gods of the underworld many thousands of years back in their family tree, my father deems them worthy of entering his domain. What about carriers? She wanted to know where she stood in this hierarchy. Hellspawn came from the breeding of gods with mortals. Demigods were the product of those relationships, and those demigods bred with mortals again, producing the species that we affectionately call Hellspawn though they don't exactly appreciate the name. Why not call them demigods? He frowned. Because the original demigod in every hellspawn breed out there is so far back in history that they have no right to call themselves gods. The power of the original demigod that flows in their veins is probably barely one hundredth of what that original demigod wielded. Wow. If a hellspawn's power was such a tiny fragment of their ancestors, then how tiny was her share? And if the hellspawn were so much weaker than the demigod who gave rise to them many millennia ago, how strong were real gods? She stared at Ares. Just how powerful was he? Carriers cannot enter the underworld. My father doesn't grant them that right because they are a product of a mating with a mortal. Only Hellspawn are allowed to enter because they are born from a mating between pure Hellspawn parents that can trace their families back to their ancestor and prove it. The power in your blood is likely less than one thousandth of your demigod ancestor, and you have no way of knowing what bloodline you're from. In turn, that demigod's power was probably barely one thousandth of that of the god or goddess who created them. He smiled when she frowned. 
getting the picture now? She was. In the grand scheme of things, she was barely above human to this man and his father, and as powerful as a gnat. Do Hellspawn live forever too? He laughed. Gods don't live forever. We can be killed easily enough. We age differently to them. Hellspawn have longer lifespans than carriers and mortals, but I have never heard of one making it past three centuries. And he was almost a thousand years old. You must have seen a lot of things change. She picked at her croissant and sipped her cold coffee, still struggling to get everything to sink in. She knew a little more about Hellspawn and carriers now, but she still had a million questions. For every one he answered, two more sprang up. He shook his head. Only in the past two hundred years, nothing changes in the underworld. He had spent the first seven hundred plus years of his life in the underworld with his family. She looked down at the oak floorboards. What was it like down there? She glanced at Ares, tempted to ask him, but held her tongue. He looked tired of her questions, and he certainly didn't look like the sort of man you pushed for answers, so she took to using her imagination. She pictured the underworld as a dark, bleak place full of black rocks and dead souls, with the occasional river of lava or bubbling pit. She shuddered at the thought of living in such a place for centuries and pushed the images out of her head. How's your back? Hopefully a change of topic would give her time to comprehend everything that he had told her, and she honestly wanted to know if he was feeling better now, and why he had so many scars. It's fine. You don't have to worry about it. I can heal most wounds in barely a few hours. He could? No wonder he had told her that he didn't need her to heal him. She could have saved herself some energy and not scared herself half to death if he had explained that to her earlier. She also wouldn't have fallen asleep in his bed and awoken in his arms. Heat curled through her with that delicious memory. Waking close to him, his strong arms pinning her to his bare chest, had felt dangerously good, so good that she wanted to do it again. You have scars, though. She nodded towards his shoulders, and he looked over them and then casually lifted them. Every time I pay penitence, one remains to remind me of what I did, he said, voice gruff and deep, and her eyebrows slowly knitted into a frown. There were countless scars on his back. How many times had he allowed someone to inflict such terrible punishment on him as she had witnessed last night? Merrick had said that Ares had never learned to hold his black tongue. He had spoken that language twice in her presence in the short time that she had known him. Did he curse often and invoke the wrath of the gods? Why didn't he just curse in a language that wouldn't end in punishment? What about the scar on your chin? Was that penitence too? She blushed when he frowned at her. She probably shouldn't have mentioned it. It was barely visible through the short layer of dark stubble coating his jaw, and the surprise in his expression silently asked how she had noticed it. There was no way she was going to confess that she had been staring at his lips, wondering how good they would feel pressed against hers when she had spotted it hiding in his stubble. He touched his chin, and a smile tugged at those sensual lips, dragging her eyes to them and sparking images in her mind a fantasy about kissing him and feeling the dominant force of his mouth claiming hers. My father made this one remain to remind me and Diamond that we were troublemakers. Diamond has the same scar. He grazed his hand along his jaw and around the back of his head and scratched his neck. She had never seen him look awkward before. He looked cute and boyish, but with a dash of wicked, we were brawling in the underworld when we were young and caused a little mess. He used his finger and thumb to illustrate how small it had been, bringing them together until their pads were barely a millimeter apart. What did you do? Having witnessed Diamond and Ares yesterday during their meeting, she could imagine that they had fought often as kids and still fought now. They seemed to contrast each other perfectly. 
she smiled to herself. It did make sense in a way. Ares was fire, and Diamond was ice. Their parents must have known they were going to be trouble from the start. He lowered his hand into his lap and sighed, his striking eyes lighting up with amusement, as though he was recalling that day and the trouble they had caused. If he was, it looked as though it had been fun while it lasted. We just wiped out part of our mother's garden, he said, and that didn't seem so bad to her, unless Persephone was very particular about her garden. And the buildings near it, and a little bit of the mountains behind it. Just a slice, and they looked much better for it. Very forbidding and fitting as a backdrop for the fortress. Megan gasped. That's your concept of a little mess? You should have seen the other times we fought. The times my father doesn't know was us. He grinned at her, charming and handsome, his eyes full of fire that brought out her own smile. Her grandmother had thought she was trouble. Megan had nothing on him. His concept of trouble was destroying mountains. We were young, and we learned our lesson. She didn't think they had, but she held her smile. Ares was so different around her today. Did he like having her around? She liked being with him, and deep in her heart she knew it wasn't because she could be herself around him. He was warm and funny and caring and six-six of sexy. He wreaked havoc on her with just a smile, and she flushed all over whenever they touched, even when it was the most innocent of brushes. Did she affect him as badly as he affected her? She hoped that she did, because she wanted him to feel that whatever connection they shared, it wasn't because he could touch again. She wanted him to feel something for her, because she was beginning to feel something for him. Chapter 11 Ares fell silent and pensive, his eyes locked on his knees where he sat in the red armchair of his living room, prompting Megan to wonder what was on his mind. She picked at her croissant, popping pieces into her mouth, and waited for him to come out of his thoughts. She leaned back into the couch and looked to her left, beyond his bedroom, to the windows and the world outside. It was growing dark. The sun had set, and the sky was full of deep pinks and gold that faded into inky blue. He raised his head and fixed his gaze on her. I have to go to the gate. What is this gate that you and your brothers kept mentioning? She said, and the warmth evaporated from his dark eyes. It's probably better you don't know. He stood and walked into his bedroom. She rose from the couch and followed him unwilling to accept that as an answer. She wanted to see the gate for herself. He and his brothers had mentioned it often, and it had piqued her curiosity. It sounded important. That wasn't the only reason she wanted to go with him, though. She didn't want to be left alone in the apartment while he disappeared for God only knew how long. Take me with you, she said, and he paused to regard her with a confused gaze. It cleared, and he shook his head. No. Then take me home. He frowned, and his eyes darkened two full shades, filling with shadows and verging on black. No. It was more forceful that time, and he raked his dark gaze over her. The flecks of red and gold brightened, and his pupils dilated, and the muscle in his jaw ticked beneath his stubble as he turned away. I don't want to stay here alone. She really hadn't wanted to admit that, and the way he looked over his shoulder at her, rugged features awash with concern, made her look away. He wasn't the only one who hated admitting to any weakness. At least call Marek. An unholy snarl left him, and he was in front of her in a flash, ribbons of black smoke caressing his muscles in a way that made her jealous. He grabbed her upper arms in a bruising grip and pulled her close to him until his hard body pressed against hers, and she quivered right down to her core, wishing she was in only her camisole so she could feel his bare skin against hers. She swallowed and tilted her head back, looking up into eyes that glowed as fiercely as the fires of hell. Why do you want me to call my brother? 
His voice was a low growl of pure animal aggression, and she had the feeling that if she said the wrong thing, the next place he would teleport would be Seville, and he would go to war with his own flesh and blood. She shivered, hot all over from his display of possessiveness. I don't want to be alone, and I felt safe with him here. She gasped when he pulled her closer, settling one hand in her lower back, and snarled again. I will not call my brother. No man other than me will see to your safety. Do you understand? Megan swallowed and nodded. Oh, God, but she understood, and she liked it far too much. He already saw her as his. He already felt that she belonged to him. He wasn't willing to let another man near her. Her heart trembled in her chest, shaking as much as the rest of her with the pure hit of pleasure that rocked her. He loosened his grip on her and then released her and shifted his hand to her face. His palm was hot against her cheek, his fingers teasing the line of her jaw and tickling her neck. He swept the pad of his thumb across her lower lip, and her knees weakened as his eyes fell there. Anticipation swirled inside her, making her restless. She wanted that kiss he kept promising her with his dark eyes. She wanted to belong to him, body and soul. You will be safe here, Megan. I swear it, he whispered, his gaze rooted on her mouth, softening as he continued to brush her lip with his thumb. I would never allow anything to happen to you. Do you believe me? His eyes finally left her mouth, and she released the breath she had been holding. She met his gaze and nodded. She did believe him, with all of her heart and every drop of her blood. He would protect her from anything, even his brothers. He wouldn't allow anyone to touch her. That both pleased and frightened her. What if it did turn out that he was only interested in using her until he regained his power, forming no emotional attachment to her? She would want to leave rather than allow that to happen. Would he let her leave? The dark, possessive edge to his eyes and his touch said he wouldn't. He would seek to keep her with him and convince her to surrender to him. Would she be strong enough to resist him when her desire for this powerful warrior had already stripped away her defenses? She slowly nodded. Good, he murmured, and his gaze returned to her mouth, softening once more. There are protection spells in place around my apartment. I will know if anyone tries to enter and will come straight back to you. I promise. Not good enough. He released her and stalked over to his closet. Her body mourned the loss of his hands on her and the heat of his touch. He slid the door open and reached inside, and she expected him to go for his weapons, but instead he came out holding the amulet she had seen. It had repelled her, but he could touch it easily enough. Was it linked to the gate? He tossed it onto the bed and then grabbed a black shirt and slipped his arms into it. He buttoned it and then took his holster and settled it around his shoulders. She still hadn't figured out why a man with his power needed weapons. Was it so he didn't draw too much attention to himself when fighting the demons he and his brother seemed to hate so much? He picked up the amulet, slipped the chain over his head, and tucked the circular pendant inside his black shirt. I will be safest with you, she said unwilling to give up and behave herself like a good little girl. She wanted to see that gate, and she didn't want to be left alone. Going with Ares would fulfill both of those desires. She found her black trainers by the couch and stuffed her feet into them. He shook his head. Not going to happen. He pulled a black band out of his pocket, neatened the top half of his hair, and tied it at the back of his head leaving the underneath down. He crossed the living room to his motorcycle and shoved his feet into his boots. Please? She hadn't tried playing nice. Perhaps it would prove to be his weakness. He had blushed when she had thanked him. If she asked nicely, would he cave and let her come along? He huffed and stalked back towards her, immense and formidable looking every bit the warrior with his black clothing, weapons, and the vicious edge to his eyes. The gate is a dangerous place, 
It attracts demons. Demons feed on fear, Megan. If one shows up and you're scared, you'll make it stronger and make it harder for me to deal with it. He positively growled the words at her, and for a moment she reconsidered her desire to go with him. Only for a split second, though. The thought of encountering more demons unsettled her, but she felt certain she could keep her head if anything happened, because she knew Ares would protect her. She was better out there with him than in here alone. He hesitated a few feet from her, the darkness in his eyes lifting, raising her hope with it, and then black smoke swirled up and around his legs. Damn him! The darkness engulfed him. Megan lunged and grabbed whatever her hands hit, determined to make him stay so she could convince him to let her come along. The colors of the apartment whirled together and her stomach twisted with them, her head spinning in the opposite direction. Frigid air caressed her skin. Something hit her. Or did she hit it? It hurt either way. She grunted as her shoulder and hip slammed into something damp and very hard. It smelled like grass. Stubborn, Ares huffed, and his hand claimed her arm, and the world spun again, racing upwards this time. Her feet hit the ground and her knees buckled. His grip on her tightened and kept her upright as the colors around her slowly arranged themselves into vague shapes and pitched up and down. Are you all right? He whispered, concern lacing his tone and warming her. She managed to nod and took a few deep breaths. He let go of her arm and turned away from her. The vague shapes surrounding her became clearer, gaining details. She turned slowly on the spot, taking in the scenery and rubbing her arms to keep the chill off them as the cold wind blew through her black jumper. Skeletal trees surrounded the clearing, their limbs black against the darkening sky. Buildings towered over them, dotted with lights of different intensities. The sound of cars filled the silence, a distant, constant hum. She was standing in the middle of Central Park. The area around her was pitch black already, but she had to be in one of the meadows. Ares? she whispered, scouring the darkness for him. Quiet. His voice came from barely a few feet behind her. She turned that way and squinted, trying to make him out. She could just about see his outline. He moved, and a bright purple flash blinded her, illuminating him where he stood with his right hand held out in front of him, his palm facing the distance. The silver and black disc of the amulet shone against his palm, streaks of light emanating from it. A tiny purple dot formed in the darkness meters in front of him, glowing like a firefly. His eyes narrowed on it and it dropped so it was a few feet from the grass, and began to grow, forming a ring that lay flat above the ground. It spread outwards and flashed, and another ring appeared. Tiny glyphs tracked the outside of the smaller ring, shining green and blue. The larger ring flashed again, and symbols appeared around the inside of it. It began to turn clockwise as the ring inside turned anti-clockwise, and both grew. They birthed more rings and larger glyphs, all of them swirling in a rainbow of colors, shining so brightly she was sure everyone in the park must be able to see it. Was this the gate? It slowed to a halt, measuring more than twenty meters across, a huge circle of symbols that hovered flat above the ground, and faded in brightness so her eyes could make out all the tiny details, the elaborate swirls and elegant symbols, and the rings that encompassed them all. It was beautiful. Her stomach vibrated with the energy that pulsed off it in waves. The central circle flashed and suddenly a man was there, slowly rising out of the swirling mist of colors. He floated upwards until his feet were visible and then stopped. He neatened out his long, dark winter coat and walked towards her, floating on air. The man reached the edge of the gate and stepped down onto the grass. He nodded to Ares, his vivid golden eyes glowing in the darkness, and then smiled at her and walked away into the night. Ares continued to stare at the gate. It began to move in the opposite direction, 
shrinking at the time, the glyphs disappearing with blinding flashes. It grew smaller and smaller until only the one ring remained and then collapsed with a harsh burst of purple light. When her vision came back, the gate was gone and Ares was staring at her, the amulet in his hand still glowing faintly. You shouldn't be here. The darkness and ice in his tone made her jump, and she took a step back as he advanced on her. It was stupid and dangerous. She ignored him and looked beyond him to where the gate had been. It was impressive and beautiful. He huffed, grabbed her arm, and pulled her flush against his hard body. Heat flashed over her skin, chasing the chill away, and she looked up into his eyes. The red and gold in them brightened when she settled her hands on his chest, feeling his warmth through his black shirt, and his heart pounding erratically. It skipped a beat when she pressed her fingertips into his hard pectorals and held his gaze. That gaze lowered to her mouth, and she tilted her head back, silently urging him to put her out of her misery and go through with it this time. She just wanted one kiss, needed to know his taste. She would make it stop at just a kiss. She would. She wouldn't let him use her, and she wouldn't use him. It would go no further than a simple kiss, until she was certain of her feelings for him and his for her. She swore it. Did she really care if he was out to use her? Her heart said no. Her mind said yes. They pulled her in opposing directions, and all the while Ares held her, his eyes locked on her mouth. His lips parted, and she mirrored him, staring at his mouth and wondering what it would taste like. She ached with the need to know, with the desire to feel his mouth on her. He held her for what felt like hours, his eyes never leaving her mouth, and his heart drumming out a fast rhythm against her palms. He slowly tightened his grip, drawing her closer, crushing her against his body, and forcing her to tip her head back further in order to keep looking at his mouth. Kiss me, she thought. She couldn't take it. She leaned into him, tiptoed, bringing their mouths closer together. Just centimeters of cold night air separated them. He would barely have to dip his head to capture her lips. Didn't he want to? Didn't he crave her as much as she craved him? She could barely breathe. Anticipation coiled tightly inside her, squeezing her lungs, and she was ready to explode from the slightest brush of his body against hers. His chest heaved against her palms, heart working overtime. He craved her. She knew it. He was fighting his hunger, and she cursed him for it for torturing her with the thought that he might kiss her as his warm breath washed over her face. Damn it, if he wasn't going to kiss her, then she was sure as heck going to kiss him. Megan pushed herself up to do just that. He closed his eyes. Darkness swept in and cold swirled over her skin. Her stomach spun with it and she clung to Ares, head reeling and heart hammering. Her backside hit something soft. She realized she had shut her eyes too and slowly cracked them open. The apartment wobbled around her and she closed them again, afraid she would lose what little she had eaten if she didn't wait for the dizziness to pass. Her hands gripped the seat of the red couch, holding onto it as fiercely as she had held onto Ares. When her head had settled, she opened her eyes. He stood before her, hunger burning in his eyes, the dark abyss of his pupils eating away at the chocolate of his irises. She felt like a fool, knew this was only going to end in heartache and misery, but she still wanted him to kiss her. Do you have to stand by the gate all night waiting for people to knock? It must make you look like a bit of a pervert in the park. She pressed her hand to her forehead and breathed slowly focusing on it to block out the effects of teleporting twice in such a short space of time. How the heck could Ares stand doing that all the time? No. He frowned at her, dark eyebrows pinching tightly above his beautiful eyes. I can feel when it needs to be opened or if someone is trying to open it. 
He stepped closer, crouched, and gently stroked her cheek. She shivered and stared deep into his eyes, losing awareness of her surroundings as she fell into them. God, she wanted, no, needed him to kiss her. She needed to know if he kissed as good as she imagined he did. Are you all right? he murmured, and his frown became one of concern. Before she could answer, his phone rang. He drew his hand away from her face, stood and pulled the phone from his pocket. He brought it to his ear and stepped away from her, his expression losing all trace of warmth and something surfacing in his eyes. I'll be there, he said before pocketing his phone and turning back to her. I have to go out to a meeting with my brothers. They might have found out something about the demon and how to get my powers back. Oh, okay. The spot behind her chest ached, and she resisted the temptation to rub it as a strange sense of disappointment crushed her heart. She had known he would get his powers back eventually, but part of her had expected it to take a while and that she would have some time with him before it happened. It was wrong of her, but a small piece of her heart didn't want him to get them back at all. Selfish. She had seen the pain in his eyes when he had spoken to his brothers about his power. A blind person could have seen it in him. He suffered without it, and who was she to wish such pain on him, wanting him to never retrieve his fire? If she honestly felt something for him, anything at all, then she should want him to get his power back and be happy again, shouldn't she? But having his power hadn't made him happy. That power had cursed him to a life of loneliness and pain. She looked up into his eyes. The desire was gone, replaced with hurt and a sense of vulnerability and even fear. It was as though hearing his brother talk of his power had stripped away all of his strength and confidence, all the brashness she had come to like about him. It struck her that his brashness was just a front that he broadcasted to protect the truth underneath, a truth she had just realized. He felt lost without his power. And she had hoped he wouldn't get it back. It had been brief, only a heartbeat of time, but she had still wished it. Stay in the apartment this time, and don't follow me, he said, and she nodded lost in her thoughts and hating herself for wanting him to suffer just so he could be with her. He disappeared, leaving only tiny swirls of black smoke behind. Megan sighed and sank into the couch. She hoped he could get his power back. She had never wanted hers, but she felt that it was a part of her and it made her who she was. She wasn't sure how she would feel if the Frenchman had taken her power rather than Ares's. No, she was sure. She would have felt as lost as Ares did. A sense of determination and resolve flowed through her as she thought about that, and she made up her mind. She would help him get his power back, if she could, because he had lost it protecting her. She would do all she could for him, even though she knew that when he regained his power, he would lose his ability to touch her. The ache in her chest worsened. He would leave her. Chapter 12 Ares appeared in the middle of the front garden of the elegant Japanese mansion. Large stone lanterns lit the winding gravel path between the impressive covered wooden gate that broke the line of the whitewashed wall behind him and the large wooden single-story building that sprawled in front of him. Fingers of pink and gold clouds laced the lightening sky above the mansion signaling dawn was well underway, and a chill hung in the damp, wintry air. Lamps in the entranceway of the building threw golden light upon the underside of the graceful ribs of curved gray tiles of the porch roof and the raised wooden floor, a warm welcome that drew him towards it. His boots crunched on the gravel as he walked, insides a swirling maelstrom of emotion that refused to settle. The light early morning breeze rustled the skeletal trees dotted around the grounds of the mansion and soothed him, easing the edge off his nerves. He didn't want to be at this meeting, even though he knew that this place was where he belonged. He should be here with his brothers, not hidden away in his apartment, snatching what precious time he had with Megan. 
He should have taken her home already, ridding himself of temptation so he could focus on his mission. It had crossed his mind several times in the past 24 hours, but each time his heart had pushed it away, stamping it out of existence and telling him to keep her. He couldn't keep her, no matter how much he wanted to do just that. It was impossible. He towed his right boot off, set his foot down on the porch floor, and removed his left one. He picked both of them up, depositing them with the other shoes and boots lining a shelf closer to the door. He hated having to walk around in his socks like this, but Escher was particular about the mansion, and since it was now solely his home, Ares didn't have the right to complain. He had chosen to leave decades ago, along with many of his brothers. Only Diamond had remained with Escher in Tokyo, and even he now split his time between this city and Hong Kong. Ares smiled with the memories this place always brought to the forefront of his mind. They had shared this mansion for over a century, safe here, surrounded by powerful wards and spells. There had been fights, more than he could count, and laughter, and good times, as well as bad. They had taken care of each other, a group linked by more than blood and brotherly love. This was where he belonged, and as much as it pained him, he had to remember that. He had to get his power back. The slatted wooden door opened in front of him. You're late, Escher grumbled, but stepped aside to let him enter. His younger brother hadn't changed the place much in the past few decades, but the alterations he had made were ones they all agreed made the place far more comfortable. The huge open-plan central room of the mansion stretched over fifty meters from one end to the other, linking the two wings of the horseshoe-shaped complex. On the left side of it, near paper walls that divided it from the kitchen, was a long, low wooden table and cushions. On the right, Escher had brought in cream couches that formed a semicircle around a huge television in the corner. Definitely an improvement, although the viewing left much to be desired. Ares had lived in Japan for over a century, but he had never grasped the language. Escher spoke it like he had been born and raised in the country. He found that strange, considering Escher very rarely spoke to mortals. Why bother to learn how to communicate with them if you wanted nothing to do with them? Not that he could blame his brother for despising humankind, not after what he had been through. Escher's deep blue eyes turned stormy and his black eyebrows knitted into a frown. Ares turned his gaze away from his younger brother, not wanting him to get the impression he was thinking about his past, even though he was. It didn't take much to trigger an episode in Escher. He was surprised his brother hadn't gone off the rails when he had called him to New York. His right eyebrow lifted as he surveyed the huge room. He wasn't the only one who was late. Both Valen and Marek were yet to arrive. Karis and Callistus lounged in the small television area. Karis had his nose in a book, and Ares knew he wasn't really reading it. He was trying to shut out the incessant gunfire blaring out of the television. Callistus twisted the controller in his hands and barked something unintelligible at the screen. He raised his hand as though he intended to throw the controller and then quickly snapped it back down and hammered the buttons, his expression darkening with determination. Personally, Ares didn't see the appeal of beating up virtual enemies. It was far more fun to do it in real life. The screens that normally covered the wall opposite him had been drawn back, revealing the two wings of the traditional building, the covered wooden walkway that flowed around the three sides, and the beautiful garden. It was the one thing he had liked about this place. The principal construction materials in the building were paper and wood, and the first few years after their arrival had been the worst when it came to controlling his power. He had spent a large part of those initial years out in the garden, avoiding setting fire to the mansion and learning to harmonize with his power so he had more control over it in its new state. The extensive garden had been manicured to perfection, each pine needle trimmed until the trees in the central courtyard looked like something from a painting, 
with oval layers of green that wound upwards from curving brown trunks, and each pebble in the gravel had been raked until they lay smooth. Every boulder was laced with bright moss that looked like velvet as it hugged the deep gray rock. The remaining fading leaves of two large maple trees at the far end of the garden where it rose and dipped in small perfectly devised hills added a splash of color, bright crimson against the morning sky. Most of the leaves had fallen, resting on the green moss-covered rocks and the grass surrounding the trees. In the Zen garden on the other side of the wing to his left, the gravel formed intricate lines that curved gracefully around rocks and other features. He had often lost himself in his thoughts while staring at it from the hot natural bath nearby. The perfect representation of nature in the garden relaxed him. Not a stone or leaf out of place. Nothing but beauty in its purest form. He supposed in a way it reminded him, and probably his brothers, of their mother. Serene, graceful, pure, and a vibrant, breathtaking reflection of nature. Maybe that was why it relaxed him so much. In spring, the cherry blossoms bloomed, and he always enjoyed sitting on one of the boulders, soaking in the warming sun the scent of the flowers and the light playing on the koi pond that flowed under the wing of the house on his right, directly below Escher's room. When they had lived here together, Escher had spent hours sitting on the edge of the walkway above the water, close to his favorite element, watching the fish circle below him. Their father had built this place for Escher, to give him a place of sanctuary and quiet in the mortal world, but all of them had benefited from it. Diamond sat on the steps that led down from the raised walkway to the garden, staring at the sky as it slowly brightened. Valen appeared and flipped off Escher before he could say anything. Yeah, I'm late. Had to send a filthy demon back to hell. He rubbed the back of his right hand across his bloodied cheek wiping the evidence of his battle away, and shifted his bright golden gaze to Ares. You're right. The bastards are getting annoying now, and Rome's other world looks like shit. Karis sighed. Ares knew that his older brother was going to wait until they were locked in the middle of the fight of their long lives before he admitted that the demons were up to something. He could deny it all he wanted. It was happening, and the quicker they accepted that, the faster they could put a plan into place to stop it. Marek appeared next to one of the cream couches, slumped straight into it, and closed his eyes. He tipped his head up and rested it on the top of the back of the couch. I was sleeping, he muttered, his voice gravelly and deep. This had better be good. Haven't you found out anything about the demon? Ares crossed the room to the television area. I thought that was why you wanted me here. No, nothing yet. Merrick cracked his eyes open and wearily shook his head. He stifled a yawn. I'm still working on it. He shouldn't feel relieved by that. He knew it, but it didn't stop him from feeling it. He had thought Karis had called him here because he had intel on the demon and how to get his power back. He had thought his time with Megan had been about to end. A chill skidded down his spine. Karis turned cold green eyes on him. It was about to end. The momentary relief he had felt shriveled and died. An intervention? Are you fucking kidding me? He stormed away from his brothers. Screw you all. Go fuck yourselves. He was not doing this. He closed his eyes and pictured his apartment. Karis teleported straight in front of him and grabbed his arms, keeping him in the mansion, and Ares cursed the bastard's power. Not for the first time, either. Karis was so powerful that he could stop any of them from teleporting with only a touch, no matter how much they wanted to leave, and his older brother loved using it to get his way. It is for the best, Ares. That voice, so calm and smooth, unfaltering yet commanding, filled him with a black urge to lash out at his brother. Karis didn't know what was best for him. He was only considering what was best for the team. Ares locked his hands around his older brother's wrists and forced his hands off his arms. 
He opened his eyes and stared into Karis's, challenging him to do it, to try to make him forget Megan and fall in line. Karis's green eyes remained impassive. Do not look at me like that. Like what? Ares squared up to him. I thought it was strange that not one of you besides Escher would look at me. This is sick. No, you are. Karis twisted his hands and broke free of Ares's grip. His eyes darkened, and the sense of power flowing from him increased, pushing down on Ares. You are sick, Ares. You have lost your power, and you are vulnerable, weak. She will be the death of you. Take her home. No! He stalked away from Karis, needing the space to stop him from lashing out. He turned on his brothers, catching the myriad of feelings in their eyes. He didn't want their pity, or their anger, or any of it. He noted that Diamond had remained outside, his back to them, evidently wanting no part of this intervention either. At least one of his brothers was on his side. You have no idea what it's like, so don't you dare all stand there looking at me like you understand what I'm going through. We understand, Valen said with a cruel smile. She's pretty, and it's been centuries since you've been between a woman's legs. You want to fuck her, so fuck her. Get it out of your system and get over it. Ares growled and grabbed Valen around the throat. You dare talk about Megan like that again, and I will kill you. Valen's fingers closed over his wrist, and Ares jerked as electricity bolted through him and lit him up like a firecracker. He dropped his brother and growled again. Fight me without your power, and we'll see who wins. He rolled the sleeves of his black shirt up and cracked his knuckles. Karis appeared between them and shoved Valen away, sending him slamming into the back of a couch. He pointed at their younger brother, his look as black as midnight, and daring him to step out of line, and then turned his glare on Ares. You know I am only thinking about what is best for you, Ares. You are not thinking clearly, and I do not want to see you hurt. Karis reached out to touch him, and Ares evaded his hand, distancing himself. What's best for me? He spat. What a joke. You don't give a damn about what's best for me, and you don't understand. There's no possible way you could. Any of you. We need you to get your power back, old man, Merrick said, calm and cool, and Ares closed his eyes. Without your power, there is a danger we might lose you in a fight, and we cannot risk that. I will not let a woman be the death of you. I know that. He ground his teeth and frowned. You think I don't fucking know that? He knew it, and it killed him. He had a chance to be with someone, to touch again without fear of hurting them, and he had to give it up. Everything he had ever wanted was within his reach, but if he took hold of it, he would be turning his back on his duty. He couldn't be whole in both body and heart at the same time. He had to sacrifice something, and since said he had to let it be his shot at love, because if he took hold of it and then regained his power, it would burn to ashes in his hands, destroyed by his own flames. He hung his head and cursed in the mortal tongue, blacker than anything he had ever said in his own language. Take her home, Ares. Karis again, and he heard no emotion in his tone no shred of regret over what he was commanding him to give up. Out of all the people in this room, Karis should have been the one to understand most of all what he was asking of him. His older brother knew the pain of sacrificing love in the name of duty. Ares stared at the pale yellow tatami mats covering the floor. Merrick, are you close to finding anything on the demon yet? He lifted his gaze, pinning it on him where he still reclined on the couch. Merrick shook his head. Ares turned his gaze on Karis. When Merrick finds something, then I will get my power back and deal with the bastard. Until then, my life is mine to live, not yours to control. Megan is mine. Anyone goes near her or steps foot in my apartment without my permission, I will gut them. You try to intervene again and we will go to war, brother. He focused on his apartment and let the darkness take him. It parted to reveal the pale, coffee-colored walls of his living room, and he stared out at the dark city, 
all of his anger fading to leave a cold numbness behind his breast. What had he just done? He had threatened his brothers. He ran his fingers over the sides of his head and held it, his gaze on the floor at his feet. He had forgotten his favorite boots, not as though he could pop back and get them without looking like a fool. He closed his eyes and sighed, hoping his brothers would forgive him for threatening them and would know in their hearts that it had been instinct to push back when they had shoved him first. Diamond would talk them all down if they were mad at him. He would make them see reason. All he wanted was a little time with her. Merrick was right, though, and Karis was, too. Not the part about him being a liability without his power, but the part about him getting his heart shattered into a thousand pieces. It would happen if he let himself get any closer to Megan. He scanned his apartment. Where was she? And what was that God's awful noise? He didn't mean the rock anthem pounding at a volume that shook the walls. He meant the death shrieks that were wrecking one of his favorite tunes. He followed the horrific sound to his bathroom, unsure whether to arm up for a war before risking seeing what was happening. The door was open and the shower was on, mist steaming the glass. He caught a glimpse of Megan's dark hair as she turned and raised her face towards the jets of water. He couldn't breathe. It felt as though someone had punched him in the gut and caught him good and proper, knocking the wind from him as he stared at her, mesmerized. She was a picture of perfection. Well, she would have been if not for the bad singing. She ducked her head under the water and he hoped it would stop her, but she kept shrieking at the top of her lungs. He padded silently into the bathroom and sat on the closed lid of the toilet seat, staring at her and catching tantalizing flashes of soft pink as the steam evaporated and formed in a shifting pattern across the clear glass. He should probably leave. It would be the gentlemanly thing to do, but the memory of how good she had felt in his arms when he had woken this evening and those near kisses and his argument with his brothers had him remaining. He growled under his breath as she swayed her hips in time with the music and washed her hair. She was all dangerous curves and smooth skin that screamed out for him to surrender to his desire to touch her, to kiss her, and more. It had been hard to control himself around her before. Now it was impossible. He longed to touch her, burned with the need and desire to taste her and make her his. Megan swept her hands over her dark shoulder-length hair, slicking it back, still singing and oblivious to his presence. A smile curled his lips. She seemed at home in his apartment now and had been very comfortable around him today, probing into his life. Karis would probably kill him if he knew how much information he had given her, but Ares didn't care. It would be worth it. He liked her knowing about him, and he liked it when she told him things about herself, opening her heart to him. He liked having her around. He had never lived with anyone other than his brothers, but he could probably live with her. She fascinated him, and he had the feeling he would never get enough of her. His brothers were right. She was dangerous, but he didn't care. The water shut off. The line she was singing in time with the song ended on a scream as she turned. Ari smiled at her through the glass. Her arms bolted into action, one instantly settling across her breasts and the other diving down to cover an area he had dreamed about last night. What the heck are you doing? She scowled at him, pure fury in her rich brown eyes. His smile widened and she blushed. I was wondering the same thing. He cocked his head to one side, raked his gaze down her, catching sexy snippets of her body in the clear patches on the glass door and then dragged it back up to meet hers. Her blush deepened. Why are you in my shower? You can keep me here, but you can't make me live like an animal. I wanted a shower, and who the heck are you to stop me? The fury in her eyes darkened into something like a challenge. Did she honestly want him to answer that question? She spoke again before he could. 
You do know it's completely perverse to sneak in on women when they're showering to watch them? I heard caterwauling, and I thought a harpy had broken into the apartment. He lifted his shoulders and looked to his right. His eyes widened. Next to him on the vanity unit was a messy stack of clothes. How had he missed that? He stared at the garments on the very top, at eye level with him. Gods. Lilac underwear. Caterwauling? She sputtered, and he tore his gaze away from the lacy knickers and bra. I was singing. I happened to like this band. I did too, before you ruined it with your caterwauling. He suppressed the urge to smile when she sputtered again, mouth opening and closing, sheer horror on her pretty face. He plucked her knickers off the pile and held them out in front of him in both hands, fingers burning where they touched the lace around the waist. Is this what humans call underwear? They were tiny, and gods, they were sexy. He wished she had slept in her underwear next to him last night so he could have awoken this evening with her pressed against him in this lacy little number. If she had, he probably wouldn't have made it to sleep. He would have been counting the seconds it took her to recuperate from healing him, and then he would have pounced on her. Put those down! She looked as though she wanted to leave the shower and make him do as she said, but remained in the cubicle hiding behind the shrinking, foggy patch on the glass. It's the only underwear I have. Someone is holding me prisoner and won't even let me get some clean clothes. You want clean things? He lay the underwear down on the pile and stood. I will get you clean things. Thank you. She smiled, and he liked how she just wanted clean things over going home, was seemingly satisfied to remain with him as long as she had clothes. It boosted his confidence and shattered his control. Her eyes shot wide when he undid his belt and popped the buttons on his jeans. Her throat worked hard as she swallowed, her enormous eyes following his fingers. What are you doing? He shoved his jeans down and stepped out of them, leaving them on the tiles. His shirt followed it and then his socks, and he paused for only a heartbeat before stripping off his underwear. Her gaze darted to the ceiling and stayed there. His heart thumped wildly as he wasn't sure if he had the guts to do this. He had fought legions without any fear, but the thought of stepping into the shower with Megan, the knowledge that he would finally kiss her if he did, had him trembling and hesitating. She backed away as he approached the door and closed her eyes when he slid it open. Her teeth sank into her lower lip, teasing it, and him at the same time. What the heck do you think you're doing? She whispered, sounding breathless and flustered and not at all angry. He stepped into the cubicle and slid the door closed behind him. Her eyes opened and met his, her dilated pupils gobbling up her irises. She swallowed again and her eyes betrayed her, dropping to his chest and then lower before shooting back up to his. He casually turned the water on. The cool blast did nothing to quell the fire in his veins. He wasn't sure anything could cool him when it came to her, not even Diamond's ice. He grinned and threw her words back at her. I want a shower, and who the hell are you to stop me? Megan went to squeeze past him. He slid one arm around her waist and pulled her against him until every delicious wet inch of her pressed into his body. A thrill chased through him, heating his blood another fifty degrees, until he was burning all over. Stay, he husked, as breathless as she had been, and stared down into her eyes. I won't do anything you don't want. I just want to feel you against me. I just want to kiss you. Can I kiss you? She trembled in his arms, and he realized that he was shaking too, his nerves getting the better of him. Where was the battle-hardened warrior now? He had sworn he would be a kitten for her, and he was. Karis was right. She made him weak, stripped his confidence away, and left him vulnerable, all of his insecurities exposed to her. All of his hopes pinned on her. Her throat worked again and he thought she might refuse him. But then she tipped her head up, her eyes dropped to his mouth, and her lips parted. 
Ares took that as an invite. Hard in his mouth, he swallowed and lowered his lips towards her. They touched his, a barely there caress. He inhaled sharply and his insides flipped, a strange, unsettled feeling filling his chest. Her hands came down on his pectorals, fingers splayed and palms hot against his skin, and she pressed her mouth harder against his. He lost it. He tilted his head and claimed her mouth on a fierce inhale, sweeping his lips across hers, struggling to keep control as a thousand feelings flooded him, tearing down his strength and leaving him shaking. Her lips danced over his, soft and moist, and when her tongue caressed his lower lip, he couldn't take it. It was too much, evoking a response that was too intense, overwhelming him and turning his knees to liquid and stopping his heart. Divine. Ecstasy. Her kiss was bliss and everything he needed, but couldn't take. He grabbed her waist and shoved her off him, stared down at the tiles beneath his feet, and breathed hard, every muscle straining and shaking. Gods. He pulled in a deep, shuddering breath and held it, searching for some calm amongst the storm, needing to get his feelings under control so she didn't think he was a total freak. Or a virgin. Hell, he might as well be one. It had been close to three centuries since he had kissed a woman, enough time to make him lose what skill he might have had and forget the basics. You taste like mint. He needed to say something, anything, no matter how ridiculous it sounded. It was better than panting like a boy wet behind the ears and looking like an idiot. I used your toothbrush. I'm sorry. She sounded breathless again and not at all sorry, and he liked it, and how fired up she was. The kiss hadn't only affected him. It's almost as though you wanted me to kiss you he muttered, and lifted his eyes to hers, catching the spark of hunger and truth in them. She opened her mouth, and he swooped on it. He slid his hands down to her backside and groaned at the softness of her and pulled her close to him again, so all that softness pressed against the hard steel of his body, a perfect contrast that only aroused him further. Her mouth worked against his, her tongue braver than his own was coming out again to trace his lips in a profoundly erotic way that had him trembling for more. He frowned, shifted one hand to the nape of her neck, burrowing his fingers into her brown hair, and kissed her harder. Her tongue brushed his teeth, minty and moist, and he opened for her. The initial touch of their tongues sent a 50,000-volt shock through him, lighting up every nerve ending and making him moan. He bravely met her tongue caressing the tip of it with his, and she moaned this time. He tensed and groaned, stroked her tongue with his, wanting to hear her pleasure again. Her hands skimmed up his chest and she settled them around his neck, fingers plowing through his hair, twirling the strands around them and anchoring his mouth to hers. He couldn't resist her. He ground his hips forward, rubbing his erection against her belly, and she gasped into his mouth. Gods, she was dangerous. He felt the full force of it now, and it hit him hard. He wouldn't be able to stop at just this kiss. This taste of her wouldn't satisfy his need for the beautiful mortal. He wanted more from her. He wanted to keep her. His duty was to his father, to his world, and his own kind. He had sworn to protect the underworld and his family. No matter how many times he told himself that, it didn't stop the hunger and need rolling through him, crashing over him and carrying him away. Fuck, Megan made him waver, ripped apart his defenses and broke down the barriers around his heart. She was dangerous and she would be the death of him if he let things go any further than this, because once he knew all of her, it would only be a matter of time before he fell in love with her. How would he ever be able to cope if that happened? Tasting her, knowing the feel of her skin and the pleasure of her body, would only damn him and torment him for eternity. And she would only leave him. He couldn't bear it. 
Ares broke away from her and grabbed her waist, locking his elbows as she tried to get closer to him and keeping her at a distance. The hunger in her eyes slowly died, and confusion replaced it. I can't. He despised those two words. Everything he had ever wanted was right in front of him, within his reach, but he couldn't take it. His power was a part of who he was, and that meant he wasn't himself without it. He had to get it back. It didn't stop the feelings from colliding inside him, pulling him apart. He wanted her so much, even when he knew that it would never work out, that he could never have the forever he needed with her. The moment he regained his power, he would lose the ability to touch her. It would be torture to remain with her then. How long would it be before she left him for another man? She would never stay, and he would never be content with only being able to see her and not touch her. It would kill them both. The gate called him. Fuck, he had never been happier to have his duty. He needed some space and time to think, and going through the machinations of opening the gate for a hellspawn would free up his mind for just that. More importantly, he needed to let her go. I have to go out. He forced himself to take a step back, and she looked as though that action had been a knife and he had plunged it deep into her heart. Her eyes searched his, and he hid nothing from her, hoping that if she saw what he was about to say, it would make it less painful for them both. I won't be long. When I come back, I'll take you home. She wrapped her arms around herself and stared at her feet, and he hated to see her looking vulnerable and small. He was such a bastard. He sighed and resisted his need to touch her cheek and tell her that things weren't going to end the way she was imagining because he didn't have the heart to lie to her, even when he wanted to and wanted to lie to himself at the same time. God, he wanted to pretend this would all work out, but it wouldn't no matter how fiercely he wanted it to. Be ready to go when I get back. She nodded, and it broke his heart. Bitter disappointment swept through him, bringing cold in its wake that hardened his heart. He had expected her to say something, to fight him on his decision. He had wanted her to fight for him and tell him things would all work out if he only gave it a chance that the deep desire he felt for her drummed within her, too, and they were meant to be together. He had thought she wanted to be with him, her words and her actions an indication that she would be happy here with him if only he could give her basic necessities and that she didn't want to go home. Clearly, he had been wrong about her. She didn't feel the same way as he did. She already wanted to leave him. He left the shower and toweled off, grabbed his clothes and stalked from the room, unable to take it any longer. In less than an hour, she was going to return to her world. She was going to leave his forever. His chest ached. He would never see her again. His heart shattered. 